Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. I am Zach. I am your chill companion through the world of leftist literature. And last week, we finished up The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. We got through the final part of the final chapter of it. Uh, despite having a power outage and having like a, about an hour and a half, two hour break in between, pressed on, people, people stuck with me. I, I thank you all for that as well. And uh, we finally finished it up. So tonight, we're going to alternate back to the communist side of things, and we are going to start the first part of The Principles of Communism. And this is a text by Frederick Ingalls, who you may know from the uh, Communist Manifesto. He was one of the co-authors. And uh, he, he doesn't get as much play as, as Marx, but he is definitely very instrumental in the foundational parts of setting up communist doctrine and theory and philosophy. And this book in particular, I, fe I feel, is, is the, the kind of book that, that a lot of people expect when they open up the Communist Manifesto. They expect to have just a list of here's what communism is, here's, here's what we envision for the future, you know, point by point by point. And instead, it, it's more just a, a more or less an advertisement to join the Communist Party um, and, uh, you know, get, ex get excited about being part of, of something that, that moves beyond capitalism. So, so instead, this book is, uh, is more that. It, it lays out a bunch of definitions. It, it talks about uh, the various aspects of what a communist society might look like. It itself is is uh, it's a pretty short read. I think it's even shorter than the Communist Manifesto itself. Um, so so it's only I think it's only just under fifty minutes for the audiobook version that we're going to be looking at tonight. We'll probably get about halfway through. It'll probably be a two part series, uh, and then you'll have a much better understanding of communism if it's something that you're you're new to. So, as always, I welcome any questions that you may have as we go along here. No such thing as a dumb question. There are such things as trolling questions, and that's about the only thing that I don't put up with. But, but anything that's asked in good faith and is, is really in the spirit of, of trying to understand things better, even if you disagree, uh, that's, that's not a prerequisite here. You don't have to agree with the things being said. You, you may have all different array of perspectives, um, as long as they're not perspectives that include genocide towards people of any kind, uh, as, as long as it's a, what I would say, a, a good faith perspective. Uh, that, that's just fine if you have any questions or disagreements or comments you'd like to add. So uh, let's get into what we're going to be looking at now. So that, that uh, opener, which I'm going to try and track down the guy bef before we start here. I just thought I'd mention that that opening song uh, was a, a trap version of the International, uh, one of the the, I guess. One of one of the classic pieces of communist uh, music, and, and it talks about you know workers rising up and shaking off their chains, all the, all these sorts of things. Um, and I, I just really like this particular version of it, so I'm going to try and track down the the author of this music, and perhaps that will become the new intro music for uh, both the Twitch stream and then, and then of course, I'll add it on to the, the future uh, YouTube videos as, as well as the, the podcast. So let me know what you think about that idea, if, if that you know, gives you uh, more of a buffer than just my cold open after random music. So if, if this gets you in the mood for, for learning about theory, let me know. Um, and then... Uh, let's move on. Whoops, clicked on the wrong one. So, the the person that we're going to be using, or the channel, I should say, that we're going to be using for this particular audiobook is a really great one. It's called Socialism for All. Very clear, uh, nicely paced readings of of different, excuse me, different pieces of theory, uh, and. Um, I, I just really like this one, so we'll probably uh, stick with this for any of the, the future communist readings. I don't think they go into to anarchy as much, but there's, there's plenty of other resources for that. Um, so you can check them out. Just look for Socialism for All on, on YouTube. And, and this one it says it was published in 1847, and it's basically just an essay. It's not, not, not actually technically a book but we're going, we're going to treat it like any other piece of literature. 
So let's give it a start, and, and as always, be pausing for, for commentary. Uh, I'm going to try and, and fold in those, those other theories that I, I like to talk about, besides leftist ideas. Uh, the, uh, those theories being permaculture and new urbanism. That, that's what I'm trying to do with this channel, in, in case you're new to this uh, channel. I, I like to try and combine all those theories into to one big thing, which I call Solaris, which just means of the sun. And it's supposed to represent the interconnectedness uh, that's, at, that's at the core and the, the interdependence that's at the core of, of all three of these uh, areas of thought. So it's my, my idea to just kind of try and combine as many of those ideas as possible and see if we can come up with something that works well for the present day and also into the future, considering the, the sociopolitical as well as the environmental problems that we face in the future. So if you have any questions about those philosophies as well and how they might tie in, those would be great questions to ask as well. Let's get started, though, on The Principles of Communism by Frederick Engels. Hi, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is March 22nd, 2020, and this is an audiobook recording of Friedrich Engels' 1847 document, The Principles of Communism. Before we get into the audiobook, I just want to ask you quickly, please hit the like button. Also, subscribe if you haven't already and click the notification bell to get a message every time we drop a new video. All of that and commenting as well helps to boost the video in the algorithm so that more people see this video, more people see the channel, and more people learn about socialism from us. And uh, nothing wrong with learning about socialism from somebody else, I guess, but wouldn't you rather have them learn it from a Marxist rather than like a libertarian? Okay, so... Well, that's Friedrich Engels, 1847, sure. The Principles of Communism. Sorry, I meant to pause it there. That is definitely for sure. You don't want to get your ideas of communism from people on the right because they're not going to be too amenable to those ideas. They like their hierarchies. Even the, the confused uh, so-called right libertarians, um, you may have seen their, their yellow and, and black flag that's supposed to represent money and, and, and anarchy. Uh, or, or also capitalism and anarchy, which are two things that can't possibly go together. Capitalism relies on rigid hierar hierarchies. That, that's how owners make money, by, by exploiting their workers. Um, so they have a very funny vision of what freedom is. They basically limit it to freedom to do whatever sort of business you like and form whatever business contract you like. And beyond that, there's no, there's no other thing that gives you freedom. So yeah, don't get your ideas from them. Come to a, an actual source that, that cares about the material. So I, I definitely agree with that. Written October, November, 1847. The source is Selected Works, Volume 1, page 81 to 97, Progress Publishers, Moscow, 1969. First published in 1914 by Edward Bernstein in the German Social Democratic <clears throat> Party's Forwarts. Translated by Paul Sweezy, transcribed by Zodiac, MEA, 1993. Marxists.org, 1990. Always important to keep in mind. Oh, and I apologize. I should have had the closed captioning on. I'll pop those on right now. Uh, always important to remember that, that with a lot of these texts, like even The Conquest of Bread, I, I don't believe was originally written in English. Um, this, this as well, uh, Engels was a German man, so I don't, I don't know if he made any of the translations himself, but it sounds like it was translated by another person. So it's, it's always important to remember, just to, just to keep in mind that this is not the original text, and there may be some, some loss in translation. So just keep that in mind. The HTML markup was by Brian Baggins, proofed and corrected by Andy Blunden, February 2005. And there is going to be a link to the source in the description below. Now into the document. One. What is communism? Communism is the doctrine of the conditions of the liberation of the proletariat. 2. What is the proletariat? The proletariat is that class in society which lives entirely from the sale of its labor and does not draw profit from any kind of capital. In other words, the workers, not the owners. The people that own the businesses, that, that, not, not just the bosses, but the people that literally own the businesses, those are the ones that, that are the, the actual capitalist class, right? Uh, there's that meme going around that like, oh, you, you know, you're not an actual capitalist unless you actually own uh, businesses. Uh, otherwise, you're just 
um, well, I can't say the word that, that is popular now, but basically you're a suck up for uh, capitalism. You're not an actual capitalist. I tend to disagree with that. You can believe in, in philosophies that, that you yourself cannot enact. I mean, otherwise it'd be kind of strange of us to call ourselves anarchists or communists or socialists when we don't live in a, an, an even uh, halfway anarchist, socialist, or communist society. So, you know, just, just a little quibble that I had with that particular meme, but continuing on. Whose weal and woe, whose life and death, whose sole existence depends on the demand for labor. Hence, on the changing state of business, on the vagaries of unbridled competition. The proletariat, or the class of proletarians, is, in a word, the working class of the 19th century. Three, proletarians, then, have not always existed? No. There have always been poor and working classes, and the working class have mostly been poor. But there have not always been workers and poor people living under conditions as they are today. In other words, there have not always been proletarians any more than there has always been free, unbridled competitions. 4. How did the proletariat originate? The proletariat originated in the Industrial Revolution which took place in England in the last half of the 18th century, and which has since then been repeated in all the civilized countries of the world. This industrial revolution was precipitated by the discovery of the steam engine, various spinning machines, the mechanical loom, and a whole series of other mechanical devices. These machines, which were very expensive and hence could be bought only by big capitalists, altered the whole mode of production and displaced the former workers because the machines turned out cheaper and better commodities than the workers could produce with their inefficient spinning wheels and hand looms. The machines delivered industry wholly into the hands of the big capitalists and rendered entirely worthless the meager property of the workers, tools, looms, etc. The result was that the capitalists soon had everything in their hands and nothing remained to the workers. This marked the introduction of the factory system into the textile industry. Once the impulse to the introduction of machinery and the factory system had been given, the system spread quickly to all other branches of industry, especially cloth and book printing, pottery and the metal industries. Labor was more... In so he's, he's trying to separate out industrial capitalism from... And I, I don't even know the right term for it, but, but before there was industrial capitalism... Uh, especially men used to go out and they would find someone to apprentice with. It was, it was the, the master and apprentice sort of a system for a lot of the different trades. I guess trade capitalism seems like a good term. I don't know if it's the right term, but basically instead of uh, just selling your labor to a random corporation or, or large industry, you would, you would pledge your services to say a blacksmith. I guess that's kind of the classic example and you become an apprentice blacksmith and you would learn the trade as you were doing the trade and you would work your way up to journeyman and then supposedly eventually you would get to be a master and you have your own business of, of your own, you know for you to run on your own that, that was a, that was supposed to be the trade-off you give your labor to someone else for a certain number of years and then eventually in return you get to be the next boss basically the next owner of, of the means of production, you set up your own practice. In some areas, uh, you might then say that you had enough money to uh, take on a wife, uh, if you were a man, um, and then, you know, you, you set up your own household and that sort of thing. So, so this is a different form of capitalism that kind of took that over once the Industrial Revolution happened and production could get ramped up enough to suck in all the the excess labor that that was just kind of floating out there um you know underutilized for one reason or another and more divided among the individual workers so that the worker who previously had done a complete piece of work now only did a part of that piece this division of labor made it possible to produce things faster and cheaper it reduced the activity of the individual worker to simple endlessly repeated mechanical motions which could be performed not only as well but much better by, by a machine. In this way, all these industries fell, one after another, under the dominance of steam, machinery, and the factory system, just as spinning and weaving had already done. But at the same time, they also fell into the hands of big capitalists, and their workers were deprived of whatever independence remained to them. Gradually, not only genuine manufacture, 
but also handicrafts came within the province of the factory system as big capitalists increasingly displaced the small master craftsmen by setting up huge workshops, which saved many expenses and permitted an elaborate division of labor. This is how it has come about that in civilized countries at the present time, nearly all kinds of labor are performed in factories, and in nearly all branches of work, handicrafts and manufacture have been superseded. This process has, to an ever greater degree, ruined the old middle class, especially the small handicraftsmen. Yeah, so, so that's the sort of thing that I was talking about, how it used to be. We would have, um, he calls them handicraftsmen, people that, that specialized in a trade, and they would do that trade their whole life. A big difference between the two is, is specialization. So we've gone from someone who would run an entire, well, so let's just keep on the blacksmith example, run an entire blacksmith shop, you know, everything from making things like nails to, to straightening tools and making tools, uh, all the different things that a blacksmith would do, as well as the financial side and, and everything, you know, top to bottom, running the blacksmith shop. We've gone from that to the dominant form of labor being very specialized. So you might only make pins or something like that, or, or nails, let's just say nails. You might uh, only sit at your workbench and make nails day after day after day after day, or on an assembly line as that, as that got ramped up, this hyper-specialization. To me, that's one reason that, that capitalism, especially this form of capitalism, is completely incompatible with theories like permaculture, because it goes completely against, uh, I mean, for, for a variety of reasons, but, but this one sticks out. The, the principle of um, integrating rather than segregating in capitalism means that, that you don't have as much specialization. The idea is to go back to, a, not necessarily back, but just move towards uh, being able to do a lot of different things and also having a lot of different elements that you then need to have some knowledge, at, le at least a little bit of knowledge about each one of them and, and how they all function together as a whole, rather than just this hyper-specialization. This increased segregation of tasks down to very minute uh, little procedures to the point where, say, like in a, in a doll factory, you may stand at a station where you pull the hair through and, uh, and out the top of the doll's head. And that's the entirety of your job. You're not qualified necessarily to do anything else. I mean, obviously, it wouldn't take long to retrain you, but you do that one thing day after day, or you work on an assembly line that, that butchers animals, and all you do is swing a giant cleaver and cut a certain part of the meat all day long again and again. To me, that, that's, that's moving in the opposite direction of integration of a system. That, that's breaking it down, that's atomizing it, going backwards. Now, there's a whole bunch of other reasons why I believe it's incompatible with, with uh, why capitalism and, and permaculture are incompatible. But that's one that just stuck out in, in regards to what he was talking about with specialization and the destruction of the, the tradesman class. Of, of old. But let's continue on. It has entirely transformed the condition of the workers, and two new classes have been created which are gradually swallowing up all these others. They are, one, the class of big capitalists who, in all civilized countries, are already in almost exclusive possession of all of the means of subsistence and of the instruments, factories, machines, and materials necessary for the production of the means of subsistence. This is the bourgeois class or the bourgeoisie. So this is, this is an ownership class far beyond what had, what had come before it. You, there, there, sure, there were big businesses before that time, things like the East India Company, uh, the Hudson Bay Corporation, but these were more anomalies. These weren't the rule until uh, industrialization really got ramped up and then people just started getting so much capital coming in from this extreme specialization. And it is a very efficient, efficient way to do things. It's an efficient way to siphon the, the, the labor and efforts of your workers up into your pocketbook. And if you have more workers, you can siphon more money all at once. And then uh, you can then turn around and use that capital to start sucking up all the competition or just putting them out of business, opening up the market to yourself again. It's definitely efficient. In that regard, but I mean, again, we're, we're, we're trending towards efficiency at the complete expense of any sort of resilience. 
So that's why you see that, that like, for example, in the 2008 uh, financial crisis, all it took was a couple of very large institutions to suddenly go under, and it started a domino effect throughout the economy. So there's, there's not a lot of resilience in the system. As long as things are humming along and things are, are uh, business is expanding, you're expanding to new markets, you're exploiting more people, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, keeping things rolling along, then it works really well. But as soon as there's any little bit of slowdown, I mean, with this sort of capitalism, any sort of a slowdown means a recession. A recession is just is, is not negative growth. It's just a slowdown in growth that's significant. And, and that sort of thing happens. You have a complete turn down in the economy. Uh, it's it's this this really boom and bust cycle that that's so prevalent with this form of capitalism. It's not really resilient, especially for people. I, I mean, the, the lower down you go, the less resilient it is. And the less secure it is for for you and your future. So again, that's an, an, one more reason that I don't believe it's compatible with uh, with permaculture. And it's not really compatible with new urbanism as well, because you're doing everything for the profit of just a handful of people. So entire towns are springing up. For the service of basically a handful of people and everything else gets kind of pushed to the wayside gnarly dude thank you for the follow we are talking about or we're, we're going through the audiobook of the principles of communism by frederick Engels tonight uh, i do this this theory stream every friday night uh big diggle 666 thank you also for the follow so yeah, so I do this theory stream every every Friday night. We've we've gone through a couple different books, done the Communist Manifesto and the Conquest of Bread. Now we're on to the Principles of Communism. So that's my Friday night stream. I do that pretty regularly at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then on Sunday nights, I, I do kind of whatever I feel like. I've been doing permaculture a lot lately. Uh, this upcoming Sunday, we'll be talking more about new urbanism with uh, Dan Platt of the Three Lefts podcast, a really great podcast you all should check out. So yeah, I hope you like what you see, and, and I hope you stick around for this and future episodes. So anyway, uh, when you when you have these these company towns starting to spring up, there's there's not really much thought to making a city livable, and in in, in new urbanism, livability is is one of the big metrics, one of the key metrics you're going for is is having that vibrant, diverse, really uh, lively city. That's what you're trying to produce, you know, very strong communities, lots of interactions between community members and for the purpose of having rich and diverse lives for your citizenry. Doing everything towards the, the, the aim of a few capitalist class individuals put, pushes that all to the wayside. You don't think about parks, you don't think about pollution, you don't really think much about health care because to them... It, it gets to be that that people are more or less interchangeable machinery. They're just one more component to the machinery of their production. That's all they think about them. It, it's it's why you hear so much the idea of unskilled labor. It's it's a, a very dehumanizing term, isn't it? Where you 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 are just inter you're just an interchangeable face. You could be anybody. And you don't like it, you shouldn't complain because you could just as easily be replaced by another person. It doesn't matter. There's there's nothing unique or special about you. No reason for anyone to. Um, there's no reason for for anyone to care much if you're gone and if you're replaced by somebody else, right? Um, so that that to me is is also the opposite of what new urbanism is striving for. New urbanism wants clean and healthy cities, parks, amenities for, for people to go to, um, a, a rich diversity of shops for them to, to go to. Uh, that's, that, that's part of urban life. The idea that you're living with a bunch of people all crowded together more so than, than in even the suburbs, and that therefore the trade-off is that you have more entertainment, more intellectual stimula stimulation, more opportunities for jobs and stuff like that. And this sort of capitalism, this, this vacuuming up of, of all competition, 
this this uh, um, treating people as as faceless commodities, labor commodities. That's the opposite of all that. Well, let's continue on though. Two, the class of the holy propertyless who are obliged. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, lumberjack, and you're high right now. Cool. I look like Count Dankula. Okay. Guy in the black and white looks like Count Dankula. Well, he does have quite the the beard. It's it, I mean it's mostly goatee really, with just a little bit on the sides. But sure. Uh, mysterious. Who is this mysterious monster? State-sponsored hose in communism, then I'm all for it. Okay. No, there wouldn't be necessarily state-sponsored much of anything in communism. Workers would, would own their own means of production, so they decide, you know, how to produce stuff, basically. I think they are free. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Moving on. Pledge to sell their labor to the bourgeoisie in order to get, in exchange, the means of subsistence for their support. This is called the class of proletarians or the proletariat. Five. Under what conditions does this sale of the labor of the proletarians to the bourgeoisie take place? Labor is a commodity like any other, and its price is therefore determined by exactly the same laws that apply to other commodities. Right. This is, this is part of the dehumanizing of the, the working class that I was talking about. It's a commodity like any other. It's the same as your other pieces of machinery in your plant, except for you got to pay it as well, uh, just for it to be able to maintain itself, right? In a regime of big industry or of free competition, as we shall see, the two come to the same thing. The price of a commodity is, on the average, always equal to its cost of production. Hence, the price of labor is also equal to the cost of production of labor. But the costs of production of labor consist of precisely the quantity of means of subsistence necessary to enable the worker to continue working and to prevent the working class from dying out. The worker will therefore get no more for his labor than is necessary for this purpose. The pr right. What a playa. Okay. Oh, what a playa. Yeah. Okay. Do you guys have any uh, questions about the, the text that we're actually looking at? Or are you just going to make gardening jokes? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't so much matter to me, but just curious. So yeah, so workers, um, instead of even considering how much they are producing and, and where the profits from that production are going, things are looked at from the other end. It's how much can I get away with paying this person where they will actually be able to come back if we're talking about the lowest here, uh, and if we're if we're looking at even the higher tiers, what's the what's the minimal amount that I can get away with paying for them to stay in whatever job? So it's very convenient. I mean that, that that's why even small business owners like to look at things from the capitalist perspective because it means they don't have to care about any sort of idea that they are taking from their workers. You hear them all the time say things like. You know, even while I'm at home, my 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 business is working for me. And that's really a euphemism for the, the people of their business continue to work and continue making money for the the business, which of course goes to them or or wherever that, that owner chooses to go. It just doesn't enter into their mind that if you are not physically working at your job and yet you're somehow making money that you have to be taking it from the efforts of someone else. So I tend to favor this perspective where we turn that on its head and say how much is being taken from the worker for the benefit of the owner. I think that's a, a fair way to look at things and it, it conforms to reality, I think, a lot more clearly. For money to be able to be made at a business, workers have to be working. And, and if workers have to be working, they have to be producing something whether that's a good or a service, and the profits from that production have to go somewhere. So if they're not going, if, if only a portion of that goes back to the workers, the rest of it has to go somewhere else. And where does it go? 
it goes to the owners to be disposed of as they will. The price of labor, or the wage, will, in other words, be the lowest, the minimum, required for the... Uh, yes, Frederick Engels was a German. This is a, an English translation of his work. ...maintenance of life. However, since business is sometimes better and sometimes worse, it follows that the worker sometimes gets more and sometimes gets less for his commodities. But, again, just as the industrialist on the average of good times and bad gets no more and no less for his commodities than what they cost, similarly, on the average, the worker gets no more and no less than his minimum. Economic law of wages operates the more strictly, the greater the degree to which big industry has taken possession of all branches of production. Okay. Six. What working classes were there before the Industrial Revolution? The working classes have always, according to the different stages of the development of society, lived in different circumstances and had different relations to the owning and ruling classes. In antiquity, the workers were the slaves of the owners, just as they still are in many backward countries and even in the southern part of the United States. In the Middle Ages, they were the serfs of the landowning nobility, as they still are in Hungary, Poland, and Russia. In the Middle Ages, and indeed right up to the Industrial Revolution, there were also journeymen in the cities who worked in the service of petty bourgeois masters. Gradually, as manufacture developed, these journeymen became manufacturing workers, who were the, even then employed by larger capitalists. Seven. Okay, so I like how he laid that out there. He, he made the connection between the owners and the workers in, in large capitalist systems as being the same kind of uh, exploiter-exploited relationship that, that existed during medieval times, or, or not necessarily even medieval times, but up and through uh, to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the, the, the lord and serf relationship, where you weren't exactly a slave, but, but you were all but a slave. You had to pledge your, your fealty to a lord. Uh, you may have to defend them in battle, and you pledged a certain amount of your crops if you were a, a farmer to them, or a certain amount of whatever it is that you produced to them. And in exchange, they supposedly gave you protection uh, and rule of law and all that sort of thing. Not so far removed from a worker who doesn't own any means of production and has little, uh, little hope of ever owning any means of production and the masters that, that basically control a good portion of their lives, decide how much they will make, decide uh, if they move up in whatever business they're in, basically pull all the strings that, that decide their fate. So I like how he made that connection there. In what way do proletarians differ from slaves? The slave is sold once and for all. The proletarian must sell himself daily and hourly. Okay. So this is, this is the, the sort of brain-dead question that, that capitalists love to ask. If workers are tired of being workers, why don't they just become owners? We'll move beyond the point that not anyone can just go up to a bank and get a loan like, like there's such a thing as credit score, and that purposely is slanted to the disadvantage of people that start out with a lot of money, we'll just push all that aside. Let's say you can get a, a loan, and you become an owner. You're probably going to need workers for your business. So that just means you've turned from being exploited into exploiting other people. That still perpetuates the same system. What communism is trying to do is push beyond that point, so there are no exploited people, so that everyone who works a job also owns that means of production. So we're getting rid of the entire exploiter-exploited relationship. Okay, yeah, he can try, but again, let, let's, let's put it in more stark terms. If slaves don't want to be slaves anymore, why don't they just become slave masters? Is that making a better world if they were able to even achieve that dream? If they were able to turn that whip around on other people? That still makes slaves in the world. Do you want more slaves in the world? I, I would hope not. I sure don't. And I don't want more exploited workers either. It's the same sort of thing. So the means of production uh, in the modern era uh, what that means is, is basically whatever means 
uh, whatever goods or services you are producing to make a living. Um, that that's it. So if you're working a factory, it would be all the machinery and and the building and the lands of the factory. If you are say a landscaper, that would mean the tools and the equipment that you use to be able to do your service, um, as well as any materials that you have to buy. Those would all be the, the sorts of means of production. That's what I'm talking about. Your ability to make a living, more or less. So if you own a technology company that makes software, you still have people, you're not gonna be doing all the coding, right? You're not physically gonna be writing out every piece of software, right? Even if you did that at the, the beginning in order to, say, get a loan from the bank, eventually you're going to get to the point where you employ people to do that work for you. You employ people to come up with the stuff that makes you then money from that point out. So you've then moved from, from being a worker owner to being uh, a owner who's exploiting other workers, basically. So no different than any other sort of product or service. If you own those means of production, even if it's an intangible thing, I think that's probably what you're getting at. If it's not a physical thing, let's even say uh, intellectual property. Say you're a, a, a publisher and you own the rights to, the, the copyrights to all of the authors that, that contribute work to you. You own the means of their making money, right? They have a contract with you. You give them a certain amount of money, perhaps up front, perhaps in installments, doesn't really matter. But they're doing the work of writing and you were doing the work of owning, basically. Um, and you were taking the profits that, that come from that, right? So it doesn't matter if it's a tangible thing, if it's an intangible thing. You can still be an owner of the means of production. I hope that clears it up a little bit. So the means of production in the case of, of say, technology, like a piece of software, would be whatever the product or the service is. Um, if we're talking about software, that, that's generally a product. Say you're an antivirus company. You make antivirus software, right? That that may not be a physical thing, but still, by by packaging that that bit of code, which is something, it's it's not something you can hold, but it's something that is stored somewhere. By packaging that bit of code and then selling it, that that is the product that you're selling. So, the the labor that goes into making that code, protecting that code, and then distributing that code, that's all the means of production, basically. Um, Yes, the, the means of production are not necessarily the people themselves, but through their labor, the means of production actually produce. Does that make sense? So, so yes, if you were some coder at a, at a software company, you yourself are not exactly the means of production, although in a certain way the capitalists do look at labor as part of, of you know, like I say, part of the machinery that, that, that runs their business, that makes the... the, the the stuff or the service that, that they provide. Excuse me. So, so the labor itself is not the means of production, but it is producing the means of production. Human greed fuels progress. And that's just how humans wor work, I assume you meant. They're spineless creatures, my dude. I don't think that's true. I think there's plenty of examples where people, just of their own volition, will do wonderful things. You can look at examples like, say, Wikipedia, where people from all over the world volunteer a lot of time in, in many cases to put out fact-based, as accurate as they can possibly make, well-cited, well-documented knowledge into the world. That's an example of, of people not being motivated by greed, not being spineless, and producing something that, that's pretty useful and, and wonderful in the world. And I don't think there's any reason to believe that people are, are by nature evil or, or greedy or anything like that. We are by nature social creatures that have to collaborate and work together to create basically anything. It just happens that, that certain people have taken advantage of that and gotten into lofty positions, which they then use whatever means they have to maintain those positions. So they become owners of one thing or another and then they just slam the door behind them. So I don't think people in general are that way. I, I, I believe more in, in the goodness of people, and I don't think we would have survived as, as societies for any length of time if that weren't the case. Uh, you could take a small example. 
Most people stop at stop signs, right? Even if they don't think there's a cop around, even if they think they could get through just fine, most people will stop at a stop sign. That's kind of strange, isn't it? I mean, you could say that maybe it's just social programming, but if they were just greedy and evil and all self-serving, wouldn't they be trying to get as, as many advantages as possible, including saving time? But they do it because it's, it's part of the society that they live in, they see a value in it, and they voluntarily go with that, that sort of a, a uh, design because they think it's for the best. Um, so no, I, I don't think people are that way. Most, human, most humans are greedy. Well, I mean, okay, I've given some examples because they are told, they think of themselves. I said coder. Uh, sorry if I misspoke. I meant to say coder, <laughs> not cotter. <laughs> Thanks for the correction. You're naive then, my dude. Okay, well, I mean, I've given you examples of why I think the way I think. I've, I've shown that there's, there's plenty of wonderful things that can happen when people work together. We've built these civilizations through, through working together. And you haven't given me anything else but just saying, I'm naive, I don't get it, people are this way. You're just making statements. You're not really, you're not backing it up with anything. So if, if that's all you got, I guess we'll just have to leave it at that for now. Uh, you halted a stop sign to keep your own driver's license because there's a small chance of getting seen. Do you though? What about uh, you see a child and and they they drop something and uh, their 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 parent or whatever who is with them doesn't notice? Would you pick it up and give it back to them? It doesn't it doesn't profit you anything. Like it, it literally gives you nothing other than maybe a good feeling. I think most people would. I think most people will stop to help a child if they can. You going to tell me that they're all just self-serving, just evil? I would like to hear some, I mean, if we're going to continue this discussion, I really got to hear some examples of why you think people are not those things. Like, like what, are you gonna, what are you going to give me to counter my, my, my arguments here? I think more than anything, people want dignity. People want a sense of purpose, a, a, a sense of belonging in the community that they're in. They want to know that the work they do has meaning in the world. I mean... You look at a book like uh, Bullshit Jobs by David Graeber. Um, he talks about how there's a tendency from people that, that have jobs they know to be bullshit. And by bullshit, that means they serve no actual function. You know, they, they could be gotten rid of entirely. It would make no difference to the company. Uh, it would make no difference to society. They, they basically don't produce anything. A good example is someone who is hired just to be an underling of a higher up person and so that they can feel big and important that they have, you know, 10 employees working below them, right? The job has no value. And in this book, they talked about how people that, that have those jobs tend to be very resentful of people that actually do useful jobs, uh, construction workers, janitors, doctors, lawyers, all these sorts of people. They, they, they build in a lot of resentment. Now, why could that be? I would say that it's because they feel guilty because they know that they are not really producing anything of value in society. To me, that speaks to the goodness of people. That, that, that shows that people want to be productive, for lack of a better word. Not productive necessarily financially, but just do something that's useful. They want to feel useful, right? So if, if that's their motivation... That seems to be the opposite of something like just self-interest or, or selfishness or, or just looking out for themselves. So I don't really buy that, that sort of thinking. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'll, try to, I'll try this again. I'm not trying to conflate the work of the employees with the means of production. I'm saying the workers use whatever means of production to create products and services. Okay, the means of production are whatever facilitates the employee to, to make the product or the service for the business, right? Does that, does that clear things up a little bit? Most of them, they help the child to help themselves feel that they are above others. Really? You would feel like you're better than everyone else just by helping a child? What if no one saw that you helped that child? What if only that child knew that you helped them? 
are you are you only doing it so you can feel better than other people? I don't buy it. I don't buy that at all. You just want to get your paycheck? That's fine. <laughs> you you can want whatever you want. I I'm not too bothered by that. But look, here's here's some other ideas about the way the world could work. Why don't you consider those before you think that you have everything figured out already? What's what's the harm in at least exploring or entertaining other ideas? I mean, really, why are you even here? I mean, you just, I, I suppose, maybe just a troll, but... Uh, one of the things that facilitates the development of the product is the organization of the company itself. Absolutely true. There's nothing that says that an owner of a company can't also be a worker in that company. The difference, though, is that if an owner decided they didn't want to do any more work, they could stop doing it, they could delegate it to someone else, and there's nothing that anyone could say about it. There's no way they could get necessarily even fired as long as the company kept making money. Um, they can just go home and collect money. So that's the ownership part of it. The ownership is the part where you get to decide where the profits of that company go. That's what makes you an owner more than, than anything else. So owners often do work themselves. They may put in long, grueling hours themselves. They're also still profiting off of the labor of the people below them. That's the difference. I know people like that, not with human nature. Cool. I mean, we could just anecdote back and forth, but, but what's really the point of that? How would you seize the means of production from a company like Facebook? Explain what that process means to you. <laughs> okay, so if by whatever means, all the Facebook employees who are not owners that had no say in where the profits were going got together and decided to take over the company by whatever means they could. That's, that's not the important part. But if they did take over the company and then decided that they would collectively from that point out make decisions together about compensation, about job duties, about health care, all the major things that, that go into employment. They would democratically make those decisions. That would mean that they had seized the means of production. Put Zuckerberg in the gulag. Yeah, well, we're not talking about how they would seize the means of productions. We're talking about what it would look like if they did seize the means of productions. There's a big difference there. No, see, communism doesn't necessarily mean that the state owns everything. That's a misconception. It's supposed to be uh, run by the proletariat themselves. So there's many forms it could take. You could have workers' councils where um, all the different uh, industries would get together and, and decide things like, like laws and that sort of thing. But the industries themselves, like each individual, individual factory, would be collectively owned by the factory workers. It doesn't necessarily mean state ownership of things. That, that's a misconception there. Uh, is communism a democracy? I mean, it certainly can be a democracy. That's, that's what it is ideally, right? It's where the, the owners or the, the workers are also the owners and they collectively make decisions and then democratically as a society make laws and, and that sort of thing, right? Nothing incompatible about communism and democracy. My argument is not convincing with technology companies. What does that have to do with company benefits? Well, that's one of the major components of a job, right, is what benefits you get. We're talking about health care. We're talking about paid sick leave, maternity leave, paternity leave. All these sorts of things are decided by someone. Who is it decided by? Ultimately, it's the owner, right? So if you're all owners, you collectively decide that. That's why benefits are important, component of what you're voting on. You're not going to necessarily vote on every single decision. You're not going to necessarily vote with you know, who you get your raw materials from. Uh, you, you know, have, you're going to still have day-to-day -day functions where you'll have managers, which are not anywhere above in, in terms of making the grand decisions from the workers, but they still may direct the, the flow of work. You're going to have accountants who are still doing things, like keeping the books. You'll have all those same sorts of positions. You're just getting rid of someone that sits over everything and makes all the decisions as a dictator basically. That's the big difference. Uh, what is the current powerhouse of the U.S.? The current economic powerhouse of the U.S., for the most part, is imperialism. 
we we go into countries and we make bad trade deals with them because they have less political and military power and we exploit them for their labor and their other resources so that we can make cheaper products and and get goods for cheap uh, that's how we're the economic powerhouse what's wrong with going to the the example of that there are still plenty of factories around the world this is still a, a important thing but it doesn't really matter it, it can be applied to every anything you're focusing in way too much on the idea that, that it's a factory that I'm talking about this could be anything this could be a, uh, let's say a Denny's a Denny's could be run by the employees you get rid of Mr. Denny wh whoever the owner of of that franchise if it's a franchise or whoever the the owner of all the Denny's is you get rid of them and the workers then for each location, get to make the major decisions for that location, right? It, it's no different than a factory. Well, I don't know why you're focusing in so much on that. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Do, do I like it? I, do I like it to be a democracy? C, C. Okay. I would, yeah, I like democracy. I like, I, I myself consider myself to be an anarchist. I, I like to have power as spread out through as many people as possible. That guards against one person coming in and taking over and, and imposing their will on everybody else. I want decisions to be spread out. I want compensations to be spread out. I like democracy. So yes, I do. And how much democracy do you have in your workplace right now? It doesn't really matter where you work right now. Um, unless you're the owner, you probably have very little say on any of the major parts of your job, right? You can't write your own job description. You can't decide what hours you work, what schedule you work. You can't decide how much sick pay you get. If you, if you even get health care at all, you can't decide any of these things. It is run as a dictatorship, right? What I'm talking about is bringing democracy to that, democracy to the workplace, where every worker has an equal say in all of those major decisions. All right, there's, there's, you guys are going way too fast for me to get all of them, so I'm just going to have to skim through your, your, con, your comments. Democracy is beta. Okay. So you prefer to be ruled by other people? Because that's the alternative. If you don't have democracy, which is everyone getting an equal voice, you have some people getting more of a voice. And unless you're one of those people that gets more of a voice, why would you ever want that? How is that a more beneficial system? I don't know why you, why is a brothel any different? Same, same as any other example I've given. Sex work is a service. It, it would be run the same sort of way. All the, the workers of the, the brothel would collectively make the decisions about compensation, working conditions, safety, benefits, paid leave, on and on and on no different than any other example I've given. Are you starting to see the pattern so far? Uh, yes, unions are for that same sort of thing, and I'm definitely not against unions, but unions are a step below the workers actually owning the means of production. If you're in a union, you are still an employee, and you still have an employer. What I want to do is get rid of that relationship because it is inherently exploitative. Even if you have a union backing you up to be in your corner, to, to work for these sorts of things in your favor, the employer, for the most part, is going to have more power, right? So, so I like unions. I think what would be a worker self-directed enterprise or a worker-owned cooperative would be better than even a union because then we do away with all of that bureaucracy, uh, we don't need to have a third party coming in to, to work on your behalf because you all just automatically get an equal say in these same things that a union fights for you right now. Unions are good. Co-ops are better, in, in my opinion. But yes, unions are for that same sort of thing. Corporate libertarianism is the best of the tier four governments for, oh, for warmongers. Okay, I thought you were going in a completely different direction. Providing three slots for military policy cards and bonuses to production, production, and resources extraction. Okay, cool. I'm not quite sure I, I understand what, what you're getting at there. Uh, yeah, 
uh, totally for unions. Don't get me wrong. Unions are fine, especially while we still live under a capitalist system. They're, they're definitely necessary, especially when you get up into the, the larger corporations. It gets to be harder and harder to have uh, any sort of a, a worker-owned cooperative at that point. Not impossible, though. It definitely has happened. You can look at the Mondragon Corporation, which is a, a federation of, of worker-owned cooperatives in Spain. They prove that, that, that worker-owned cooperatives can be scalable. But, but yeah, unions are fine. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with unions. We're going to get back into the book. So let's, let's listen to, to some of the ideas that, that Engels is putting out here. Orly. The individual slave, property of one master, is assured an existence, however miserable it may be, because of the master's interest. The individual proletarian, property as it were of the entire bourgeois class, which buys his labor only when someone has need of it, has no secure existence. This existence is assured only to the class as a whole. The slave is outside competition. The proletarian is in it and experiences all its vagaries. The slave counts as a thing, not as a member of society. Thus, the slave can have a better existence than the proletarian, while the proletarian belongs to a higher stage of social development and, himself, stands on a higher social level than the slave. The slave frees himself when, of all the relations of private property, he abolishes only the relation of slavery and therefore becomes a proletarian. The proletarian can free himself only by abolishing private property in general. 8. In what way do proletarians differ from serfs? The serf possesses and uses an instrument of production, a piece of land. In okay. So a question, why is having a social hierarchy as described here wrong? That's a great question. I myself am against hierarchies because I think they lead to exploitation of people. Uh, in the case of, of capitalism, uh, you have a, a, a class of people that, that basically just through their good fortune of birth or the right connections that they've made have the means of production at their disposal. They have the biggest bargaining chip and they, they can then leverage concessions out of their workers, such as working for less wage rather than starving. That, that's always the threat under capitalism. Workers starve. So hierarchies in general, they, they lead to exploitation of people. And think about any of the jobs that you've worked. Do the best people always get promoted? I bet you can think of at least one example in, in some job that you've worked where the most incompetent, meanest, worst person got promoted, most inco like completely incompetent at their job in all forms, not good managing people, not good at the business itself, not good at anything to do with the company, but they got promoted. Why did they get promoted? Uh, obviously, the workers didn't vote on who was the best among them to, to lead them all. What happened instead was, was likely they knew somebody. They had a friend who worked in the higher-ups. They had a family member that worked in the higher-ups. They, they somehow made a connection with someone that got them that better position. That's what happens when you have hierarchy, and you can't do anything about that unless you have some control over your workplace. And as it stands, most people do not have any control at all. You have zero say on who gets hired, who gets fired, how things are, are done. You, you can't make sure that the best people are the ones that, that are in management positions. It's, it's not the big brain that's always rising to the top. It's usually the most fortunate or most well-connected or the people that just have the most money through one means or another. That's why I think hierarchies are bad. They, they don't lead to um, the best outcomes for the businesses themselves. And they leave a whole lot of people behind, people that, that, that end up just struggling to survive struggling to work two to three dead-end jobs uh, for, for minimum wage or close to minimum wage just to survive. It takes all of their free time away from them because they're just scrambling to, to, to make ends meet. There's no chance of them reaching any higher level uh, uh, or higher version of themselves. Perhaps you, are, you could be a world-class artist, but you're stuck at a Wendy's because 
you happen to not be born into the right family, that, that they could make those connections for you. They could send you to the best schools where you'd meet the right people or even give you money so you could start your own business. Instead, you're working all these jobs, uh, just trying to scrape by. That to me is, is, is impoverishing to the entire world. When, when the masses, the, the majority of people, are at a point where they can never reach whatever potential they have. Now, if you have people instead all starting from a platform where they have their basics, basic needs met, food, water, shelter, clothing, education, transportation, um, all these sorts of things, that starts people with at least a chance to meet their potential, right? If you combine that with, with having more governance over the thing that you depend on to live, your job, that is, is freeing for people even more. So the, these, these two things together are freeing, right? That they, they are promoting of freedom, they're promoting of democracy. So uh, that, that, in a nutshell, is, is why I support an elimination as much as possible of hierarchies. And, and communism is one way to do it. I prefer anarchy. I think it's a little more direct and a little more complete than, than communism. I think uh, communism tends to allow concentrations of power too much. And there's always reasons for it. There, there may be an enemy attacking uh, the country. There may be an uprising from former capitalists that, that want to, to seize back control of, of the land or the, the means of production. There may be good reasons in their minds for concentrating power uh, to a certain extent, but it almost never then goes back in the other direction, in, in, in my estimation of things, from what I know of it. Um, but yeah, so I hope that, that helps answer your question. Why does society have to be structured equitably? Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be. I would like it to be. We're, we're talking about things that we would like, ways that we would like to see the world be. Society may not be fair, but wouldn't it be better if it was more fair, at least? I mean, should we just stop fighting for social justice? Should we just stop fighting for equal, equality of opportunity? Should we just, you know, throw up our hands and say, well, life's not fair, and, and just throw in the towel? I don't think so. I, uh, there's, there's no end of history. There's no point where we cannot progress beyond that point. So why not try and, and, and make life more fair for more people? We'll, we'll end up with the best outcome for everyone overall. If, if all those ideas that are suppressed in people, like I said, who are just struggling to support themselves, who otherwise could bring beautiful, wonderful things to the world, things that may help everybody, if instead we tried to empower those people, that can make the world better for everyone. But by suppressing it for the, the benefit of the few, I don't see how that makes the world any better. And I don't see why that's a system worth fighting for. So that's my opinion on that. Oh, the na oh my goodness. The natural rights of the individual. I don't know if I want to go down this rabbit hole with you. The, the natural rights of the individual. Where do natural rights come from? There's a trade-off here that you need to acknowledge. Absolutely, there's a trade-off. Instead of a, a certain class of people being able to, to dictate to everyone else who's less fortunate than them how they can live their life uh, and, and, and how they can have a relationship to the things they need to survive, which is the, the means of production, instead of a handful of people dictating to them and, and having total freedom to do whatever they want with their business, we are trading that for the freedom of everybody to live higher and better lives, higher and better versions of themselves, have more control over their daily life, have more empowerment opportunities. That's a, a trade-off I would take any day, any day. There's nothing inherently great about the people that, that happen to have the reins of power. You can look at any of the, the people that, that, that libertarians like to throw up as, as examples. Elon Musk got his money from his, his family's apartheid emerald mine in South Africa. He didn't create any of the technology that, that now runs his business. He bought into PayPal. He bought into the other companies, and he paid engineers to create the things like the Tesla and 
there's rockets and, and so on and so forth. The same is true of any of these guys. Bill Gates started with loans from his parents. Uh, there's, 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 no, there's no great men of history. There's, there's no you know, just natural order to things where the cream rise, rises to the top and, and the, these uh, billionaire playboys are, are allowed to just play with the earth and, and their little toys and shape the world in, in their own image as, as though they're modern day Tony Starks uh, or even more. That's just mythology, and it's not real once you press against it for any little bit. So I would rather empower a whole lot more people at the expense of, of letting Elon Musk play around and, and try going to space, or Jeff Bezos, or any of these people. You know, Elon Musk's family was rich. They own apartheid diamond or emerald mines. That's where he got his money from, to, to, to buy into PayPal, to have all the opportunities that he's had in his life. That's just wrong. I, yeah, see, I don't want a supreme leader either. I want a, a, a government made of, for, and by the people. Literally, not, not high and mighty officials dictating everything from on high. I want the people to, de to decide together, starting at the very basic level of the workplace and, and, and also being given the means to survive and subsist and thrive. I'm not painting, painting with a broad brush. You, you look at in the backstories of anyone who's, who's a supposed great man of history, uh, a self-made millionaire, a billionaire, a, 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 an eccentric genius who, through his own cunning, catapulted himself to the top of society. You will find time and time again someone or some group of people that gave them a lot of stuff before they had proven themselves gave them an education and access to opportunities, gave them a loan, like in the, in the case of Donald Trump, a small loan of $2 million from his father and access to a portion of Manhattan to do his real estate business and get it going. You will find this time and time again. The idea of the self-made man is, is bogus, bogus. Nobody rises alone. Everybody needs help, especially at the beginning. We are, we are, an organism that works best together, and that, that, that's no different for these, these people that, that get worshipped as heroes and, and super geniuses and so on and so forth. Uh, Rockefeller, same thing. I'm, I'm not going to take the time to go into the histories, but just look it up. These people were well-connected families before they became robber barons. They, they took over wealth from Europe and invested it in the new technologies of the day. How am I being willfully ignorant? You're not giving me really any examples, except for Rockefeller. He was not well-connected. Okay, well, I'm not going to take the time to, to, to go look into his backstory. Even if he was the one example, that's one example out of the, the hundreds of people that have been thrown up as, as these, these great men of history, where you do look into their backstory, and it's, it's wrong. It's, it's not what the, the common perception is. I, I guarantee you, you look far enough into his, his history and, and where he got his start from, it wasn't just like, you know, pushing a flower cart on Main Street, which he then turned into a, a flower shop and then a, a whole entire growing operation and then used it all to, to invest into steel and then on and on and on. He didn't start on the street and ended up, it, the rags to riches is, is by and large a myth. And even if it wasn't a myth, if, if we are saying that, that that somehow justifies holding back everybody else from their potential just so these few people can reach limitless possibilities, I don't see that as a good trade-off. I don't see that as a good trade-off at all. We're leaving behind all these potential ideas, all these potential contributions to society, to the world, in the name of catapulting a few chosen ones. I don't see that as a good trade-off at all. You're just going to have to, to school me another time because we need to continue on with this book. In exchange for which he gives up a part of his product or part of the services of his labor. The proletarian works with the instruments of production of another for the... You're, you're just saying words, my dude. You, do you see when fact shows that's not true at all, claiming that the Rockefellers was well-connected and that's not how he made his money? 
okay, even if it was one person, again, we're going to catapult this one person to limitless possibilities at the expense of everybody else having even a fraction of that possibility. To me, that's not a good trade-off. That's not a good trade-off at all. We're leaving tons of ideas, tons of potential behind for the chosen few. That's not a good trade-off. I want to elevate as many people as possible to reach their highest and best potentials as I can. That's my goal here. What's your goal? Just saying, oh, well, this guy made it himself. What does that prove? I don't, I don't even understand what argument you're making with this. I've given you plenty of examples of, of so-called self-made billionaires and millionaires uh, that did not follow that path that got their start from a wealthy friend, a wealthy relative, or, or some bank that took a chance on them. So what does it matter if you have one counterexample? That doesn't, I don't even know what you're trying to prove. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. Come on. I'm not, I'm not going to go into this with you. What? Okay. Fine. Let, let's pretend that you're right for a moment. Let's pretend that Rockefeller was completely a self-made man. So what? Does that prove that that's a good way to organize society? Yeah, pretend. I don't have whatever knowledge you, you claim to have. You're not giving it to me. So let, let's say for the sake of argument that, that you're right and, and Rockefeller was a self, completely self-made, pulled himself off the streets as a street urchin, never given a dime in his life, and somehow he still uh, became the wealthiest man of his time without any help, without any loans, without any assistance before he had proven himself. Hey, uh, I just felt the need to interject here because this dumbass felt the need to come in and waste so much of my time going on and on about uh, John Rockefeller, it proves you're lying about everything, you don't know anything, on and on like that. So I, I, I'm going to be a little bit petty here. I, I went in and, and looked at the background of John Rockefeller and wouldn't you know it, before he, he started any sort of business, he, he worked for someone else. He uh, managed to save up about $800 from, from his work, and then he borrowed $1,000 from his father, Big Bill Rockefeller, at 10% interest. His father gave him a loan, and $1,000 in, in those days was quite a lot. Uh, that would be, a, it, it was half of what was needed to, to start this business. Uh, and it says Rockefeller went steadily ahead in business from there, making money each year in his career. So there's, there's point number one, why, why John Rockefeller, this, this great man of history, was not just a self-made man. He had to take money from his father to, to start his first business, which he then parlayed into future businesses and then eventually got into uh, standard, you know, eventually made it into standard oil. That's point one. Point two, once he has a business going, it's not as though it's just him. He has workers at, at, the, at the various factories that, that, that produce the, the products that his various companies make, right? He's only able to become the richest man of his time, perhaps the richest in history, as, as the, the uh, chatter was claiming, because he exploited the work of others, okay? He's not just doing all this business on his own. He's not there. He's, he was the head of Standard Oil, right? He's not pulling the oil out of the ground himself. He's having his workers do it, and he's taking a portion of the money that comes from the oil that they use their labor to extract and lining his own pockets with it. That's how he became the, the most wealthy person of his time, perhaps even in history. Although I would bet that Jeff Bezos has surpassed that mark by now. But it's beside the point. Yet another example of a so-called self-made billionaire not just pulling himself up by his bootstraps, having his first good luck coming from his father giving him a loan, and his second piece of good luck coming from exploiting tons and tons of people in, in a booming business of his day and, and taking their, the, the, the uh, profit from their labor for himself. Not a self-made man, not, not doing everything on his own, not some you know, big brain guy who can just solve any problem that he wants. 
So I just thought I, I would I would put that to bed because, it, you know, and, and normally I don't take this long to address trolls. Normally I don't even leave the troll stuff in the comments or, or in the final video, but I felt it was necessary this time because I really wanted to drive home this point. They're no self-made people. Even if someone had not, even if he had not gotten that loan, he still would have had to exploit a hell of a lot of people to get where he was at. No one rises on their own. No one is a business of one and becomes a billionaire. It's just not possible. That's all I had to say. Just thought I'd throw that into the video. Thanks a lot. Is that a good way to organize society? Wealthiest man in history. So what? So what? So what? Is that a, you're, you won't answer the question. Is that a good way to organize society? Let's, let's say he did it all himself. Is that a good way to organize society, to hold everyone else back so that this one man could become the wealthiest man in, society, in history? Is that a good way to organize society? Is it okay to leave all those people behind for that? That's a good way? Okay. Well, I disagree. Let's hear some ideas from other people that disagree with you too. Account of this other in exchange for a part of the product. The serf gives up, the proletarian receives. The serf has an assured existence, the proletarian has not. The serf is outside competition, the proletarian is in it. The serf liberates himself in one of three ways. Either he runs away to the city and there becomes a handicraftsman, or instead of products and services, he gives money to his lord and thereby becomes a free tenant, or he overthrows his feudal lord and himself becomes a property owner. In short, by one route or another, he gets into the owning class and enters into competition. The proletarian liberates himself by abolishing competition, private property, and all class differences. 9. In what way do proletarians differ from handicraftsmen? In contrast to the proletarian, the so-called handicraftsman, as he still existed almost everywhere in the past, 18th century, and still exists here and there at present, is a proletarian at most temporarily. His goal is to acquire capital himself wherewith to exploit other workers. He can often achieve this goal where guilds still exist, or where freedom from guild restrictions has not yet led to the introductory of factory-style methods into the craft. So, if you remember back to before I so foolishly got stunlocked by someone who loves Rockefeller, uh, this is what I was talking about, the, the form of capitalism that was... was much more prevalent before industrial capitalism really got rolling. This is exactly what he's talking about. You have craftspeople that, that are temporarily the workers with the, the promise, and of course not everyone would have made it, but the promise that someday they'll become the master and, and open their own um, guild, right, where they would then become the exploiter. So a little bit different form of capitalism, still capitalism because you still have the... the uh, worker and owner relationship but he's just making that distinction distinction from modern day or modern day for his time workers crafts nor yet to fierce competition but as soon as the factory system has been introduced into the crafts and competition flourishes fully this perspective dwindles away and the handicraftsman becomes more and more a proletariat okay this is it for you bud it, it doesn't bother me that much that you're, you're pointing out a fact. I, I keep saying again and again, what does it matter even if that, that one fact, as you call it, were true? How is that a good way to, to organize society where we have the benefit of the few coming from nothing to limitless potential at the expense of everyone else they have to exploit to get to that, to that limitless potential? How is that a good way of organizing society? How is that a better way than organizing things more democratically and more evenly in the distribution of power? How is that better? That's what I keep asking you, what you won't answer. If you don't answer it, I mean, you're just serving the purpose of derailing discussion and derailing people learning about what they came to learn about. So, I mean, this, this is not about you, all right? This is about the, the work that we're, we're trying to learn together and, and the ideas that we're trying to integrate into our own way of thinking, right? Oh my God, I said every one of these people. Fine, there may be an exception to, to a rule. That doesn't mean that as a rule, it's a good thing. So what? Again, I ask you, so what? And if you, this is, this is your last chance. 
How is that a better system? If you can't answer that, if the next thing is, is well, you said everyone, but, but really I pointed out one tiny little flaw in your argument. If your next statement is something like that, you're going to get a timeout for a while because I, I can't put up with this anymore. I've devoted far too much time to, to trying to help you understand the basics of what I'm trying to say here. Okay? It should involve facts instead of misinformation. That's ridiculous. You can't be so absolutist in the way you look at information. Right? If I were to say that, that by and large, white people benefit from the, the system as it is more so than any other race in, in America, in the United States, does that mean that if you can find one example of, of a black person who did well, that that's peddling inf misinformation on my part? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. All that means is you found one tiny counter to the rule. That, that doesn't mean that everyone can follow that same path. That doesn't mean it's good for society that some chosen few get to, to walk that path while others are barred from it. That's the point I'm trying to get at. I'm not trying to mislead people. All I've said was that if you look at the, these examples of self-made billionaires, time and time again, you will find, as a general rule, an almost 100% rule, there may be some small exceptions, but as a general rule, they had some sort of backing to get them to where they're at. And this idea of being a self-made billionaire is a lie, or, or at least a creative fabrication. Does that, does that help you out a little bit more? Moving on. Variant. The handicraftsman therefore frees himself by becoming either bourgeois or entering the middle class in general, or becoming a proletarian because of competition, as is now more often the case. In which case, he can free himself by joining the proletarian movement, i.e. the more or less communist movement. 10. In what way do proletarians differ from manufacturing workers? The manufacturing worker of the 16th to the 18th centuries still had, with but few exception, an instrument of production in his own possession, his loom, the family's spinning wheel, a little plot of land which he cultivated in his spare time. The proletarian has none of these things. The manufacturing worker almost always lives in the countryside and in a more or less patriarchal relation to his landlord or employer. The proletarian lives, for the most part, in the city and his relation to his employer is purely a cash relation. The manufacturing worker is torn out of his patriarchal relation by big industry, loses whatever property he still has, and in this way becomes a proletarian. 11. What were the immediate consequences of the Industrial Revolution and of the division of society into bourgeoisie and proletariat? First, the lower and lower prices of industrial products brought about by machine labor totally destroyed in all countries of the world the old system of manufacture or industry based upon hand labor. In this way, all semi-barbarian countries, which had hitherto been more or less strangers to historical development, and whose industry had been based on manufacture, were violently forced out of their isolation. They bought the cheaper commodities of the English and allowed their own manufacturing workers to be ruined. Countries which had known no progress for thousands of years, for example, India, were thoroughly revolutionized, and even China is now on the way to a revolution. We have come to the point where a new machine invented in England deprives millions of Chinese workers of their livelihood within a year's time. In this way, big industry has brought all the people of the earth into contact with each other, has merged all local markets into one world market, has spread civilization and progress everywhere, and has thus ensured that whatever happens in civilized countries will have repercussions in all other countries. It follows that if the workers in England or France now liberate themselves, this must set off revolution in all the other countries, revolutions which, sooner or later, must accomplish the liberation of their respective working class. Second, wherever big industries displaced manufacture, the bourgeoisie developed in wealth and power to the utmost and made itself the first class of the country. The result was that wherever this happened, the bourgeoisie took political power into its own hands and displaced the hitherto ruling classes, the aristocracy, the guildmasters, and their representative, the absolute monarchy. The bourgeoisie annihilated the power of the aristocracy, the nobility, by abolishing the entailment of estates, 
In other words, by making landed property subject to purchase and sale, and by doing away with the special privileges of the nobility. It destroyed the power of the guild masters by abolishing guilds and handicraft privileges. In their place, it put competition. That is, a state of society in which everyone has the right to enter into any branch of industry, the only obstacle being a lack of the necessary capital. The introduction of free competition is thus public declaration that from now on, the members of society are unequal only to the extent that their capitals are unequal, that capital is the decisive power, and that therefore the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, have become the first class in society. Free competition is necessary for the establishment of big industry because it is the only condition of society in which big industry can make its way. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google Parent, Alphabet, and Facebook account for 23 0.8 percent of the S&P 500, but let's keep talking about factories that make shovels. You do realize this book was written uh, over 120 years ago, so yeah, it's going to talk about factories. What what are you what are you talking about, dude? Where where do you think this is going to be coming from? We are looking at a book that was written at a time when the Industrial Revolution was really starting to get into swing, and it's gonna, it's going to be flavored by that perspective. You still haven't answered my question, and you still keep talking, though. There is modern translation. Of course there is. We, we can see today how, the, the, how much influence that modern corporations have on the political system. They, they create political action committees that, that funnel tons of money into ad campaigns that influence elections for people that they think are going to influence laws in ways that, that benefit them. There's, there's plenty of translation to modern society. If you don't like this book, if it's too old for you, you, you really don't have to keep listening to it, though, too. No one's forcing you here, but this is what we're going to do. Your philosophy to today's economy and technology. So how do you seize the means of production of Facebook? How do you seize the means of production? That would be a difficult task for a company like Facebook to do it by legal means right? You'd basically have to, to force them to uh, sell all of their shares or at least controlling interest in Facebook to the workers themselves. Basically, the only way that that could happen through legal means these days would be for every single Facebook employee from the, the, who, is, who is not an, an owner of the company to walk out and refuse to work until Facebook agreed to, to sell to them controlling interest in the company, then they could reset it up as a worker-owned cooperative. That is incredibly unlikely to happen, but that's okay. I mean, we're, these, are, these are still ideas worth considering of a different way that we could organize society. So don't get too hung up on, on the, the way that the means of production are seized. Okay, what does it mean? What does what mean? Ta not talking about healthcare policies. Okay. What does the company do at that point? What do they own? If the workers take it over, I mean, the, the workers become the owners. So, so they, they own the same stuff. It's just in the hands of everybody that works for the company rather than a select few. That's the only difference. So what do we do about these companies as, as perhaps from an anarchist perspective? My idea is, is that at this point, a, a sort of a, a violent overthrow of the, of the government is nearly impossible, at least in America. Uh, it would mean, I mean, we, we have the, the, the largest and, and most powerful military in the world, unless somehow the military could be gotten on the side of the people uh, who are committing the insurrection, there'd be, there'd be no way to win. So my thought is instead, what we should do is build parallel structures, parallel institutions. If your local municipality won't build housing, you get together with your neighbors and you form a, a cooperative business to make co more cooperative housing throughout your city that you then sell at a price if you, if you need that money to keep going. Um, Sell, sell at a fair price so you can keep things going, but, but below market rate, you know. Um, 
or you, you figure out how to structure things where you can keep enough money coming in through other means to give away, or at least at a very reduced rate, the housing. So you do that. If there's a, a problem with food security, you get together and you form uh, groups like Food Not Bombs, and you take donated food, perhaps from local businesses, like a, a grocery store could give you the, the stuff that is not expired yet, but uh, it tends to be in grocery stores, they, they will throw things out before it even comes close to the expiry date, but it's still good food. Uh, it's still perfectly healthy and, and edible. You take that and you distribute it uh, to whoever needs it. That's another parallel structure you can do. We keep building these parallel structures until we provide that platform I was talking about, the basic means of subsistence, food, shelter, clean water, utilities, communication, education, transportation, these sorts of things. We build structures parallel to the government that, that is failing the people in that respect, and we just do it ourselves by, by whatever way we can. We, we, we employ permaculture principles, such as small and slow solutions. We don't think we're going to do it all at the same time, but we plant small seeds, and we, we keep tending to them, letting them grow, and uh, building them up until we have robust enough parallel non-governmental institutions that we can provide where government fails and we can give people that platform. That's my thought about it. Um, but that's not really even the point of, of this particular book. He's just trying to lay out his vision for a communist society. So he's trying to define what these terms mean to start with. He'll get more into what communist institutions may look like later on in the book. Yeah, I, I can understand the idea that it's, it's not a feasible strategy. And especially with the way the modern world is constructed, people barely have enough time to keep up with their favorite TV shows, barely enough energy to, to cook dinner a lot of the time because their jobs wear them down mentally, physically, or both so much, somewhat by design. Um, oh, let's see who just gave me a follow. Scrublord1963, thank you for the follow. We're going through the, the Principles of Communism by Frederick Engels. He's, he's starting with some definitions and some, some descriptions of society as he sees it, and he will move on later to his vision for a communist society. So anyway, uh, yeah, I can understand that it, it feels overwhelming. Um, I can understand that it, it feels like it's hard to even know where to start. Uh, what will I do, uh, and do I live in... Uh, a commune myself. I don't. I don't know of any communes that exist. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. I don't know of any communes that exist. I would love to live in cooperative housing. There are some, There is some of that that, that exists right now. I, I don't currently have enough money to buy a unit, um, and I'm, I'm working little by little uh, in my personal situation to improve my credit score. I, I paid off my car. I'm continuing to pay off debt. That's my strategy to eventually myself move into some sort of cooperative housing. Cooperative housing, similar to a cooperative business, means that, that every owner in, say, a condominium complex has equal voting on uh, the board that makes decisions for the building, right? So instead of having a homeowners association where you elect a select few to make the decisions, everybody gets a vote. You spread that power out again. So the people that have the most time on their hands and the most gripes and, and desire to control their neighbors aren't the ones that get control, as it often happens with HOAs. You also tend to have more buy-in to the long-term prospering and, and upkeep of the building because you don't have people that just get into it to, to turn a profit. It takes an investment of time and energy to uh, be in a, a housing cooperative. And for myself, that's ideally what I would like to get into someday. Not at that point myself. That doesn't mean that also I can't think about these ideas right now, try and spread around these ideas and get people thinking outside of their comfort zone, get them past that left wall of capitalism, past even uh, uh, social democracy into, at the very least, a, an idea of democratic socialism where we are talking about providing the basics for people, we are starting to talk about a government that, that uh, is, is, is 
more representative of, of the people, and most importantly, uh, democratizing the workplace, that's what I would like to do. So that, that's one thing I am doing right this very moment is I'm trying to spread these ideas. There's many different roles that people can have in, in changing the future and changing their world. This is the one that I choose for now. Big business will just F you up. That's an important truth. Um, that's, that's not a, an impossibility. You may get to the point where you build up systems that, that are competing with, with local governments for actually providing for the people of the local community. And you might get to the point where businesses are like, we don't like this anymore and we'd like to exert our influence to shut it down. That definitely happened in, in like the 60s in America when there was a big uh, commune movement. Cities across the country passed ordinances where it was illegal for more than two unrelated people to live in the same house. This is especially true out in the country where communes were more popular, but it was true in, in many cities. Um, the idea being that, that if we can legally prevent people from you know, setting up a commune, then we can, you know, prevent communism from taking root. So, so that, that's, that is not without historical precedent. Uh, precedent. Uh, yeah, there's, there's risk in any strategy, but what's the alternative? Just sit by and let, the, and let the world turn as it may? I don't think that's a good way. But anyway, yeah, there, there's always the chance that, that big business can screw things up. So you're saying ic.org. Let's see what that pulls up. Ah, intentional communities. I see. Yeah, those are pretty cool in a certain sense. They are trying to live intentionally. They're trying to live off the grid. I definitely believe in those things. I, I try to, to, as I've mentioned, uh, pull in concepts from permaculture and new urbanism, and they definitely follow some of those things. What they often don't do is have any sort of an inlet for uh, people of less means, right? And and it often tends to, to form into people that, that have a lot of extra money set aside. They've always had a dream to to go ahead and live off the land. And so they just find one of these these communities and they do it. And, you know, good on them, but, but it, it tends to leave a lot of people behind. Also... Uh, my wife and myself both both really like living in the city. Like we're, we're when I say Saint Paul, I mean in, in the actual city of Saint Paul, not in a suburb, uh, not out of the way. We have we have entertainment and culture, pretty much at our fingertips. Uh, I mean, there used to be more so, but you know, COVID has has ravaged that quite a lot. But there's still a lot there. There's there's definitely parks nearby, uh, and and we like that a lot. So. Intentional community is not a bad idea. I thank you for the, the suggestion, but I don't think it's quite for me. I, I like the urban life. I, I went to school for urban planning. I have my master's in it. And and I pursued that, that degree because I've always just been fascinated by cities. I've always loved them. So, yeah. Okay. So you go to, to IC and search for Minnesota, and that's cool. Uh, let's, let's take one second to do that. Oh, let's see if I've heard of I've I think I've heard of Zephyr Valley. Oh, there's one actually within Minneapolis. Not open to new members though. Uh Sock Center, no interest in living there. No, I love Winona. It is a beautiful place. No interest in living there. I'll go ahead and put that up on screen. That's a fine link to share. Thank you for it. Um so yeah, anyway, this is the, the inter foundation for intentional communities. If that's what you're into, more power to you. It, it's just, uh, for the most part, probably not for me. Homewood, uh, I've heard of Homewood as well. That may be something that, that I, I end up looking into when I when I go into uh, actually getting a home. I rent now, but uh, I would definitely like to be an owner. I think ownership is very important, and I want to make it available for everybody that's that's my dream is everyone to have a place that that no one can take away that uh no matter what happens to them in their life they can't have any danger of winding up on the street they can't have their landlord just sell the property out from under them they can't uh yeah i want to have a stable place for everybody i think that's important for a good and and healthy functioning society 
So Homewood, that's a, that's definitely a possibility. Uh, there's a few more in Finland, Hutchison, and the Mutual Aid Twin Cities Housing Cooperative. Uh, not open to new people. And there's a few others that I know of. There's the Makoko one. I wonder if it lists that. Student Cooperative, not really open to me. Fern Hollow. Sure. So yeah, point is, th there definitely is places where I can look at. I keep going to that one. There, there are places I can look into. I'm just not to that place yet, but, but potentially. Anyway, I think we should continue on in the book because we, we still have about 10 minutes to go. But I, but I hope you're, you're starting to, to churn some of these ideas and, and take a look at how you can apply them to modern life. Don't get so hung up on the, the particulars when they say factory this, factory that. That can be applied to, like I said, you could apply it to a Denny's. You could apply it to, um, uh, I mean, there still are modern factories and warehouses. So you could apply it to that, obviously. You could apply it to a, t a tech firm. It doesn't matter as long as it has a product or a service that it offers, even if it's not tangible, even if it's just electronic code, you're still offering a product or a service. You still could have people directly owning that means of production. Every worker could be owning that means of production collectively, right? It could also be done through the government. I tend to, to not like that. I don't know exactly what, what Engels would think about that. He might be in favor of more of a centralized uh, process or a configuration, I guess is the way to put it. But, but I, don't, I don't think exactly the way that it ended up playing out in a lot of countries is a way that he would necessarily agree with. But moving on, let's, let's move on. Having destroyed the social power of the nobility and the guild masters, the bourgeois also destroyed their political power. Having raised itself to the actual position of first class in society, it proclaims itself to be also the dominant political class. This it does through the introduction of the representative system, which rests on bourgeois equality before the law and the recognition of free competition, and in European countries takes the form of constitutional monarchy. In these constitutional monarchies, only those who possess a certain capital are voters, that is to say, only members of the bourgeoisie. These bourgeois voters choose the deputies, and these bourgeois deputies, by using their right to refuse to vote taxes, choose a bourgeois government. Third, everywhere the proletariat develops in step with the bourgeoisie. In proportion, as the bourgeoisie grows in wealth, the proletariat grows in numbers. For, since the proletarians can be employed only by capital, and since capital extends only through employing labor, it follows that the growth of the proletariat proceeds at precisely the same pace as the growth of capital. Simultaneously, this process draws members of the bourgeoisie and proletarians together into the great cities where industry can be carried on most profitably, and by thus throwing great masses in one spot, it gives to the proletarians a consciousness of their own strength. Moreover, the further this process advances, the more new labor-saving machines are invented, the greater is the pressure exercised by big industry on wages, which, as we've seen, sink to their minimum and therewith render the condition of the proletariat increasingly unbearable. The growing dissatisfaction of the proletariat thus joins with its rising power to prepare a proletarian social revolution. 12. What were the further consequences of the Industrial Revolution? Big industry created in the steam engine and in other machines the means of endlessly expanding industrial production, speeding it up and cutting its costs. With production thus facilitated, the free competition which is necessarily bound up with big industry assumed the most extreme forms. And thank you, Cart Horse One, for the follow. We are going through the audiobook of The Principles of Communism by Frederick Engels, and he's just giving some background at this point. He's laying out how the Industrial Revolution has gone. He's made some distinctions between the, the proletarians and the old tradespeople, which worked into guilds with the promise of one day themselves becoming masters. And he's contrasted that to the proletarians who have no hope of ever becoming uh, the owners of the businesses they work for. And now we're just going through some ideas of, of how the revolu uh, Industrial Revolution uh, has been taking place in his time. Keep in mind, this, is, this book is 124 years old, something like that. So it's not going to be a one-for-one -one exchange with 
present, but there's still a lot of ideas that we can we can think about, especially when he gets into the latter half of how a communist society might be laid out. And that's where we're going to be heading soon. A multitude of capitalists invaded industry, and in a short while, more was produced than was needed. As a consequence, finished commodities could not be sold, and a so-called commercial crisis broke out. Factories had to be closed, their owners went bankrupt, and the workers were without bread. Deepest misery reigned everywhere. After a time, the superfluous products were sold. Now think about that. You know, these, these, these big capitalists went out of business, and people were, were stuck in bread lines. And that, for some reason, has become the cliche of uh, more socialist-oriented countries. It's, oh, you're going to have bread lines, you're going to have people that are starving, all this stuff happens all the time in, in capitalist countries too. There, there's no guarantee that, that everything is going to be just fine, uh, especially with the boom and bust cycle. So as capitalism becomes less regulated, it, it trends more towards the boom and bust and the catastrophic bust as well. Uh, so, I mean, the, the neoliberal experiment of, of rolling back regulation, rolling back social safety nets has been going on basically since the, the 1980s with Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, and it's just been reverberating around the world since that point, to the point where hopefully now it's finally running out of steam and people are seeing that it's not the best system to, to help out the great bulk of, of humanity, and that some of these people are doing well, but for the most part people are getting left behind further and further as we continue to gut safety nets and roll back regulations in all sorts of things, uh, but, but especially the stuff that relates to big business and their influence on society. The factories began to operate again, wages rose, and gradually business got better than ever. But it was not long before too many commodities were again produced and a new crisis broke out, only to follow the same course as its predecessor. Ever since the beginning of this 19th century, the condition of industry has constantly fluctuated between periods of prosperity and periods of crisis. Nearly every five to seven years, a fresh crisis has intervened, always with the greatest hardship for workers and always accompanied by general revolutionary stirrings and the direct peril to the whole existing order of things. 13. What follows from these periodic commercial crises? First, that though big industry in its earliest stage... As I just said... This is a symptom of especially the, the modern form of capitalism, where, where you have big industrial capitalists, the boom and bust cycle. This happened even back then. You, you know, even 124 years ago, they realized this was a, a, a problem um, with capitalism, is that capital would accumulate very quickly, but just as quickly something would, would switch and it would, it would go bust and, and leave all these people without jobs, and, and have bad shocks throughout the entire system. So that is one way that we can apply what he's saying till today because it still is happening. It's just a, a, it's almost a feature of capitalism because in all these crises, there's always the people that are at the very top that can still manage to, to make a profit off of it because they can, they can have enough reserve saved up, that they can weather any storm and they can use that as an opportunity to start gobbling up those uh, in their competition, who don't have those means to weather any storm. So as, as uh, just through attrition, the competition starts wearing away. They can start branching out into new markets, which further helps them weather a financial storm. Uh, they can downsize rapidly with, without much of a, a, a hit because everybody's taking a hit at the same time. So in, in a certain way, these sorts of bus cycles are good they're more of a feature from the, the point of view of, of the the highest level uh, industrial capitalists created free competition it now has outgrown free competition that for big industry competition and generally the individualistic organization of production have become a fetter which it must and will shatter that so long as big industry remains on its present footing, it can be maintained only at the cost of general chaos every seven years, each time threatening the whole of civilization and not only plunging the proletarians into misery, but also ruining large sections of the bourgeoisie. Hence, 
either that big industry must itself be given up, which is an absolute impossibility, or that it makes unavoidably necessary an entirely new organization of society in which production is no longer directed by mutually competing individual industrialists, but rather by the whole society operating according to a definite plan and taking account of the needs of all. Second, that big industry and the limitless expansion of production, which makes it possible, bring within the range of feasibility a social order in which so much is produced that every member of society will be in a position to exercise and develop all his powers and faculties in complete freedom. It thus appears that the very qualities of big industry which, in our present-day society, produce misery and crises are those which, in a different form of society, will abolish this misery and these catastrophic depressions. So the idea there is that we have the technology to produce everything that a person might need for their life, for their well-being. All the food they could ever eat, all the, the shelter they could ever need, all the opportunities that they could ever want to have. We already produce all of that in abundance. The only difference they want to make is who gets to be the benefactor of that production primarily. Right now, it's the people at the, the, the top of these companies, the owners, that get to decide how all of that gets distributed. All they're talking about changing is who gets to make those decisions about how things are distributed. So instead of just a handful of owners, it would be all the workers of a company. Instead of just a few people in society, it's more or less everyone in society that gets to make decisions about their own life. And technology is technology. It doesn't matter if it's in capitalist hands, socialist hands, anarchist hands, it can behave the same. At the same time, if we're freeing up a lot more people, as I mentioned earlier, by getting rid of, rid of their, their need for, for baseline things, baseline survival, if we're providing that for people, we can have a lot more people to, to start looking at our levels of technology, start making contributions of their own, Contributions almost never come, almost never come, from the very top. They may have very, very broad ideas about the way things might go, but it's the engineers that decide the, how a, a piece of software gets coded. It's uh, the coders themselves that do the work of coding. Um, it's quality control that makes sure that everything moves together as it should. And it's, it's the same thing for whatever industry or business you're talking about. The, the, the people at the top are not necessarily making all the innovations. In fact, most of the time, they're not. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, it's, it's perhaps possible that Mark Zuckerberg, from time to time, finds some time to sit down and write some code. Or he comes up with a new way of doing things on Facebook and is able to articulate it enough to the engineers where he knows or he can tell them exactly what to do to make it happen, right? That may happen, but by and large, these things happen from just regular workers, you know? Um, so if we're providing for more people, we're giving more people the opportunity to make those contributions. And who knows what kind of, of technological wonders we could come up with if we're all working together, right, on the problems of society. And if we all have more or less an equal stake in the outcomes of, of the, the use of that technology. An industrialist right now, for example, doesn't necessarily need to care whether or not his company is, is polluting the environment because he can always afford to live somewhere else. He can always afford to, if the sea level is rising, he can afford to uh, move to an, an inland place, even if it meant giving up and abandoning his property entirely to the waves, contrary to the way that Ben Shapiro thinks, where somehow you will be able to sell your property to someone as the waves wash over it through sea level rise. For the, for the, the captains of industry, that doesn't really matter. They can always insulate themselves from the worst effects of their own decisions. If instead everyone has more of an equal say in, in what happens, they have more of a say in... Uh, you're having uh, more of the people that, that experience the, the outcome of those actions 
actually having a say in the way that those actions go, if that makes sense. So in a, in a factory town, I know you, some of you hate the ideas of, of using a factory as an example, but in a factory town where everyone lead, has to, all the workers need to live next to the factory, they experience the pollution from the factory, they experience bad working conditions. Now, instead of that, instead of just having to take it in order to have a job, they can make some of those decisions that, that might, you know, and, and if you had more of a say in your workplace and it was affecting your health, wouldn't you have a vested interest then, more of a stake in making sure that your company did things in a way that minimized harm, minimized harm to the local environment, minimize harm to the workers themselves. Does, does that make sense at all? When you spread power out more, you, you have a better chance that the effects of using that power are going to be tr moving towards minimizing harm, right? Because some of the people that would otherwise be experiencing that harm now have a say in how things are done. So you have that to add to the mix. And uh, because we're going to be having, we would then be likelier to have less harmful practices being put in place in whatever industry it may be or, or business. Um, secondary effects of, of environmental pollution, things like... Uh, um, you say lowering IQ from exposure to, to harmful chemicals, um, l lowering life expectancy, dealing with, with high medical bills because of exposure to, to chemicals that hurt people. Because we're exposing less people to that, because more people have a say and a vested interest in avoiding that sort of thing, we then have the benefit of, of having more people able to keep contributing to whatever work they're doing. Instead of someone having to, to stop working because they've developed cancer from being exposed to some sort of chemical that's produced by their, their company, they instead are able to keep contributing because they never get that cancer, because they've been able to make decisions that help avoid them getting that cancer. So we have that effect on top of that. And if we unleash all of these effects together, my supposition is that we will end up with better, more humane, more long-term thinking technology just, just from making that one change because now everyone has a vested interest in that outcome. You can't just leave some people behind if those people get a say too. So anyway, let's continue on. We're, we're almost to the point where I would like to be. We see with the greatest clarity, one, that all these evils are from now on to be ascribed solely to a social order, which no longer corresponds to the requirements of the real situation. Hold on one second. So, Pierce, penniless, like vaccine mandates in companies. I'm not sure from what side you're, you're getting at that from. Uh, are you saying that that would be a harm? Are you saying that that would be something that the workers could decide collectively to protect themselves. I'm not quite sure where you're going with that question, but please clarify and I'll try to answer. And two, that it is possible through a new social order to do away with these evils altogether. 14, what will this new social order have to be like? Above all, it will have to take the control of industry and of all branches of production out of the hands of mutually competing individuals and instead institute a system in which all these branches of production are operated by society as a whole. That is for the common account, according to a common plan and with the participation of all members of society. It will, in other words, abolish competition and replace it with association. Okay, so you further say, yeah, it might be grouped in with all of those things you described. I'm sorry, but again, as, are you saying that this would be a, a benefit of more people having a say in their workplace or a bad thing? I'm not, I'm not quite sure what angle you're trying to, to play with that. 
Moreover, since the management of industry by individuals necessarily implies private property, and since competition is in reality merely the manner and form in which the control of industry by private property owners expresses itself, it follows that private property cannot be separated from competition and the individual management of industry. Private property must, therefore, be abolished, and in its place must come the common utilization of all instruments of production and the distribution of all products according to common agreement, in a word, what is called the communal ownership of goods. In fact, the abolition of private property is, doubtless, the shortest and most significant way to characterize the revolution in the whole social order which has been made necessary by the development of industry, and for this reason it is rightly advanced by communists as their main demand. Okay. When he's talking about the abolition of private property, there's a couple main ways that this could go. It could be just like I said, that instead of having owners that can privately own the means of production and benefit from it, that we collectivize everything among each individual business. You work for um, a Costco, now you and your fellow workers own that Costco. So there's no longer a separate private means of production. You collectively own it as a business. That's one way of doing it. There's another way of doing it where the, the people control the means of production through the government. So you've, you may have heard of the, the poorly named dictatorship of the proletariat. The proletariat is the key in that sentence. All the people collectively make decisions about the way the entire uh, slate of industries and businesses are run. So it, that, that's a more centralized way of doing things, and that is another possibility. It's not as though you just then have a dictator that comes to power who makes all the decisions themselves. The way it's supposed to be is that the people democratically make those decisions. The people become the government directly and direct industries to provide for the needs of, of, every, of, every, excuse me, of everybody, right? We move then to a needs-based economy in the ideal situation where food and other basics uh, are tabulated. How much do, do we need as, as a whole, as, as a whole um, state? Uh, and then how can we direct industry to make things that we need in sufficient quantities? And how can we then collectively decide how to distribute that sort of thing? So there's a couple ways that can go. Uh, so you would call it it having less, say, if it's a mandate, therefore harmful, right? That depends. I mean, in the case of vaccines, it might be that, that your company collectively decides that it wants to keep its workers safe, that together you decide that, that whatever you're getting vaccinated against is a credible and real threat to all of you. And by not getting vaccinated, by any one of you not getting vaccinated, you put the whole at risk. At that point, the, the, the needs of the many would then perhaps outweigh the needs of the few, and they would mandate a vaccine at that point. Maybe harmful to, to the, the complete freedom of the individual, but overall, you may decide that it's more freeing to keep people safe from diseases that might debilitate or kill them. It, I mean, it just depends on what you decide. Co-op versus China use a controlling shares and state bank finance a bit. Okay. China used its control to make companies produce masks. Yeah. China turned out a whole lot of masks because it had more of a command and control centralized economy. More so than, than quote unquote Western governments. For better or worse, they were able to handle the crisis better than most places. Or better than a lot of places. I shouldn't say most places. Capitalist countries such as New Zealand and uh, South Korea also did very well for, uh, and Japan even did better than a lot of other countries. So it's not necessarily the government form that, that, that produced the outcome, but that's getting more into the weeds. Anyway, let's keep going. Almost done with, with uh, this session for tonight. 15. Was not the abolition of private property possible at an earlier time? No. Every change in the social order, 
Every revolution in property relations is the necessary consequence of the creation of new forces of production which no longer fit into the old property relations. Private property has not always existed. When, towards the end of the Middle Ages, there arose a new mode of production which could not be carried on under the then existing feudal and guild forms of property, this manufacture, which had outgrown the old property relations, created a new property form, private property. And for manufacture and the earliest stage of development of big industry, private property was the only possible property form. The social order based on it was the only possible social order. So long as it is not possible to produce so much that there is enough for all, with more left over for expanding the social capital and extending the forces of production, so long as this is not possible, there must always be a ruling class directing the use of society's productive forces. Okay. Oh, sorry. Let me just finish that sentence. Let him finish that sentence. And a poor oppressed class. How these classes are constituted depends on the stage of development. Okay. So in Engel's mind, this was just a natural, inevitable progression as, as forms of production took over one another time after time. This is just history rolling forward. Inevitably, we'll get to the point where we produce so much that communism becomes inevitable. I take a more pessimistic approach than that. I don't see any government as inevitable. I see definitely there's a point to say that that material conditions of especially like the working class can put pressure on things going one way or another but it doesn't necessarily make them inevitable having more wealth uh, disparity having uh, people falling further and further behind could push people towards wanting to have a more socialist form of economy a more communist form of society but even if there's that will there, it doesn't mean to necessarily have a way. It doesn't mean it's inevitable. So I take a slightly different view, but he's just laying things out as he sees them at his time. Okay, so workers deciding things. Yes, it is. So um, getting back to the idea of, of workers at a particular business deciding for a vaccine mandate for workers to keep on working. Yeah, definitely. And they may choose to protect the whole of themselves over the, they may choose that vaccinating, that is, protects the whole of them over allowing people to make their own, you know, decide to get vaccinated or not. They may make that decision and, you know, they may collectively decide that, that people that cannot agree with that will have to go find some other business to, to be a part of. They may, they may buy out their shares uh, or their share, that is their singular share, um, if they have shares at all in the company, if that's how they, they do things, uh, or they may compensate them in one way or another, and they may break their relationship off at that point. It's, it's, it's not to say that if you have a worker-owned cooperative that no one can ever get hired, no one can ever get fired, things just stay static and immutable. You still make decisions collectively. Ideally, you're moving towards consensus, or at least as close to consensus as possible, but... You don't have the, the benefit, this, the, the way that it is a progression forward, is you don't have a small group of people that get to control everything. You don't have just a few owners that control everything, that power spread out. That doesn't mean that every decision is something you're going to necessarily agree with personally, and you may have to decide yourself whether or not you want to keep your relationship up with a company if it makes a decision you disagree with. Um, that would still hopefully be your right in a, in a communist society to decide where you give your, where you uh, decide to produce things or if you decide to, to produce things anywhere. But it doesn't mean that you get to just as one person say, Oh no, no, I think it's different and that's just going to be different for me. And we have, you know, 50 workers and 50 different sets of rules that would not work. You have to come to some sort of a decision collectively it, it's it's still better than having one or two or a board of people making decisions for 10 or 20 or thousands, right? Okay, so again, the, you, you say, never heard, this guy's never heard of private property in ancient Greece or Rome. He is conceiving of private property, property differently than, than, than just anyone who owns the means of production. So it's just a little bit different in... Uh, 
definition of things. Hierarchy issues of higher capacity with less direct access, more issues of power, inevitable. So it's a question of trade-off there. Yeah, there are trade-offs in everything, of course. And the trade-off we're talking about now is individual owners don't get to run a company whatever they f the way they feel like. The trade-off being that we have more democracy and, and more uh, spreading out of power so that for the most people, uh, you have a much better say in your destiny, in, your, in the future of, of the way that you uh, produce things that, that allow you to, to keep living, basically, the way you keep doing business. Right? There, there are definitely trade-offs. It, it, it is power sharing versus concentrated power. It is the vision of a lot of people versus the vision of just one or two or a board of people. Right? Organization was more strong in his day. That's very true. Uh, worker organization is, is very weak in this point in history. Very few people, especially in places like the U.S., a very small percentage of people are in a union anymore. Mm -mm. Yeah, so in the 60s or whatever organization grew, neoliberalism, neoliberalism worked the other way. And yeah, and that really came into fruition in the 1980s with Reagan and Thatcher bringing in these neoliberal ideas of, of gutting social safety net and uh, giving more control and power, less regulation to private business. Uh, so funny how you love communism, but support employers infringing on basic rights. Okay, so... You don't have a right to work at any particular company, though, do you? Even if you're a member of that company and, and there's some line they cross that you just can't abide by, you don't have a, a, a right to keep on working for that company. And other people have rights, too. You have to balance rights. There's no such thing as, as just the rights of the individuals or just the rights of everybody. There has to be a balance. So if collectively you decide that such and such is a threat overall to people, you just kind of have to go along with it. In your, com in your company right now, how much rights do you actually have? I mean, maybe you're the owner, maybe you have all the rights you could possibly have. But if you're not the owner, you have very little rights. You, ha you have no rights over, over whether or not everyone in your company has to be vaccinated. Uh, you have no rights about the way business is done. Uh, you have no rights about compensation, about the running of the business. You have, you have no say in any of that stuff. We're talking about giving more people more say, right? Rights aren't giving. They aren't legal constructs. Where do they come from then? Where do you get your rights from? You have to get them from somewhere. I mean, God-given? Well, I mean, yeah, not everyone believes that. that I mean, you have to then prove that such and such God exists and, and says that you have these rights and that, I mean, but even still, reality can come up against that. You may say, I have a God-given right to not be conscripted in the United States. Uh, but there may be a, a war that comes along where everyone is conscripted, they do away with conscientious objectorship, uh, they... they they could decide to trample all over those rights. And whatever you thought in your mind, the reality of it would be that, that rights still... I mean, you can, you can say, oh, I have God-given rights to this or that, but reality could dictate otherwise. So I don't think that's a particularly compelling argument. Uh, where God and legality meet. I have no idea what that even means. I mean, I don't even know which God, which form of God... You're looking at it from. I could assume Christian, just because that that, that tends to be the case uh, with people that I would think would happen to be on on Twitch. But uh, you may have a, a different conception of God, so I don't know where legal and, and God meet. God and legality meet. That just doesn't make any sense as a concept to me. Yes, and 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 I can understand cart horse one that that once co-ops once business gets larger and larger. It gets harder to run things as work a cooperative, but it's not impossible. As I, as I talked about earlier, there's the example of the Mondragon Corporation in Spain, which is a federation of cooperatives. They work together as one large corporation, uh, but each individual member co-op 
runs everything as a worker-owned cooperative. They make all the democratic decisions. I'm not quite sure how they, they make decisions at the higher levels, but I would assume they would at least send a representative from their co-op to then speak for their entire co-op when broader decisions about the, the federation are reached. Like uh, they have a rule about compensation that uh, the highest paid employee can't be more than, I don't know, we'll just say 100 times more compensated than the lowest in any of the cooperatives. Okay, it's something similar to that effect. When those decisions about that, that affect all the cooperatives get made, I'm not quite sure how it shakes out, but they do it somehow. So you can have larger and larger structures of, of confederations of cooperatives. It, it, it is scalable. It's been shown that it can be scalable to a large level. Okay. Okay, you said you have a right to your body, which happens to be working at a company, or, or you, you were saying you have a right to your body, which happens to be working at a company. Where does that right come from? At the very least, it comes from a general consensus in society that we all basically agree that yes, no one can be made a slave. We then can codify that into law and abolish slavery as we somewhat have in this country, in the US, and then that has additional legal weight behind it. But at no point in there, if slavery was legal uh, in your particular country, there's nothing that you could really do to then say, no, but God says I'm free and I have a right to my own body. That, that wouldn't carry any legal weight and that wouldn't carry any factual weight. People could still coerce you into being a slave. So at some point, it is people that have to come to a consensus and decide this and such is a right, this and such is not a right. So, yeah. Oh, and you're, you're welcome. I, I'm, I'm hoping you're enjoying the, the show, by the way, Cart Horse, and I hope you, uh, if you're signing off for tonight that you, you join me for my next stream, which will be Sunday. we will be talking about new urbanism with Dan Platt to the Three Left show. Uh, probably looking at some more memes. It's going to be kind of a later show. Lighter show, not not a later show. Be probably around the same time. So I'll start at uh, seven o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, probably go like I've I've gone late tonight, but but that's okay. It's a Friday night. Um, usually my shows go about two hours. That's about all the time I, I have extra in my day, uh, twice a week. Um, it does carry legal weight. It is uh, oh, anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll finish that that thought first. So yeah, I hope you join for for future shows, and I hope you like what you saw, and at least found some of the conversation and ideas stimulating in some way. Um, it does carry legal weight. It is the God nature, not a religious God. The God nature. Okay. It's the God nature. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not making the distinction there. Even if you're appealing to this the, the saying of, of the so-called natural rights, people can still force you to do stuff if they come to a consensus that that's okay, or at least a local consensus among people that are coercing you. So, I mean, you may say that's that you still have that right. That doesn't mean you have the ability to exercise that right. Perhaps that separates things in a way that, that's more understandable. Oh, thank you very much uh, for for following again, and I hope you do join in again. And if any of you who are, are watching right now have have not yet followed, please please give me a follow. I, I do these um, leftist audiobooks every Friday night, and and then just kind of uh, a range of stuff on Sunday nights. I've been doing a lot of permaculture streams lately, getting out permaculture one hundred and one, just the basic ideas of it. I've done you know dunking on right wing chuds. Uh, just for fun, like like a lot more lighter stuff on my Sunday streams. Um, and I, I've talked with, with Dan before about new urbanism. So it, it's kind of just whatever I feel like on, on Sunday. But but Friday nights are for uh, political audiobooks. Okay, taking away your ability to exercise it is illegal. Not if the society deems it not to be. You may say, well, then the society is wrong. But, I mean, that's just, you're just standing on principle at some point. The reality comes into play where people can force you to do things whether or not you think they should be able to or not. Um, 
for a long time in this country, uh, in the U.S. The, it may have been unjust. Maybe, maybe justice is more what you're talking about than rights. It may have been unjust, uh, but legal for the government to say that, that, that two people of the, the same uh, sex could not get married. That, that only people of, of uh, two different sexes could get married, and that was, that was legal. It may have not been right for them to decide that, but they still had legal means of, of taking away your ability to do that. And you would have, and at that point, as, as a person who was attracted to people of the same sex, you would, you would not be able to do anything to stop them, right? So it may have been unjust, but it still would, would be the law, right? So, so you can make that argument that it might be unjust for your company to say that in order to keep working for you or for that company, you have to get a vaccine. But that doesn't mean they can't do anything about it, right? And that doesn't mean you'll end up being able to control the reality of the situation, even if you think that's unjust. Perhaps that puts things in, in more understandable perspective. Laws that contradict the Constitution are nullified. Yeah, but, you know... For one thing, it depends on how the Constitution is interpreted. For a long time, it was interpreted that people of the same sex, bringing up that example again, could not get married. So it 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 matters more how the law is is applied than than even how it could be interpreted. Because any law is that way. You can interpret any law to a wide ver, wide variety of conclusions, and you could enforce it in a wide variety of ways. Uh, so it, 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 it may or may not be unconstitutional to require a vaccine. We'll just bring up your example again. Maybe unconstitutional to require you to get a vaccine to continue working at a company. I don't actually know the answer to that in, in this country. I don't know if, I mean, I'd be interested if there's any legal cases you know about, but again, that could also always change, Right. We could decide that the, that the safety of the masses is more important than the safety than the free, quote unquote, free exercise and free choice of, of one person in one instance. And the Constitution itself, it's not as though that comes from nature or the God of nature or anything. It's, it's not just it's not based on it's, it's not like we come out with mathematical, indisputable, indisputable equations that that. Uh, formed together to, to form our Constitution. I mean, hell, the original Constitution didn't have the Bill of Rights. So, uh, and it's been amended several, several times. It can be amended again, right? There, there's no immutable guarantee that, that thus and such right will always be the case and always be interpreted in the same way. These things can change regardless of how you view a natural right to be. Starting to admit what? I don't know what I'm starting to admit, that anything can change and anything is possible. Sure. I wouldn't be talking about these ideas of communism or anarchy if, if I thought everything was immutable. And I wouldn't be, you know, trying to, to sift through how realistic I thought any of them are or how applicable they are to today if, if I, I didn't think that, uh, you know, conditions could be different, if I, if, if I didn't have an idea of what sort of society I wanted either. Or if I thought that they were infallible. Uh, do I know Artie's Marxist on Twitch now? I'll have to check out that streamer. Thank you very much for the suggestion. Will I be a Marxist? I'm not a... Well, okay, so... Uh, though I'm looking at Marxist literature, I'm not myself a Marxist, per se. I think he had a lot of great concepts and, and theories and, and a lot to, to say about the condition of the working class and about freedom and equality and democracy and all these sorts of things. But I myself tend more towards the anarchy side of things. I believe in, in uh, challenging and, dis and distributing power wherever it lies. I don't believe in concentrations of power. I think that's dangerous, and it, it leads to the greatest potential for human destruction and human misery and the greatest holding back of human potential. So th for that reason, I tend towards more uh, anarchist thought. But I still find these ideas valuable. But anyway, why be a Marxist who is anti-constitutional at all? I didn't say it was... Wait, wait, when did I say I was against the Constitution? I just said it was not immutable. You made the claim that somehow these laws and this Constitution come from 
the God of nature. And I'm just trying to say that any of these things are changeable. The Constitution's been changed several times. It didn't even start out with the Bill of Rights, right? I said that, that any laws can be changed when you interpret things differently, when you come to a consensus among at least the, the people that hold sway over the way laws are written and enforced, when those people come to a consensus, they can change how that law is interpreted. That basically is what happened with, with gay rights, with the ability of, of people to marry any sex uh, that they so choose. The Constitution and rights were interpreted differently than they had been in the, pa than they had been in the past. Uh, and that largely came from social pressure. Society moved on from some homophobic tendencies that it had in the past. And lo and behold, the, the interpretation of the law changed. So, and that's, and, and, and Carthorse, that's, that's totally fine. I, I will accept people of almost any political stripe on this stream as long as they argue uh, or not even not even argue i'm not so much in, i know tonight is not a great example but i'm not so much into arguing because i'm not just trying to pound someone into the ground i i'm more concerned with the exchange and the consideration of ideas so if you're not an anarchist if you're not a communist if, if you're a liberal a re republican um, a conservative you are welcome to be here as long as you're coming in with good faith and with an open mind, and um, that's that's my main rules. You know, there are some ideologies I cannot tolerate because I feel that they are more harmful than than is worth even entertaining. But for the most part, if you come in good faith, that's totally fine. Uh, you should warn that Marxist people are sometimes too combative. I, you know, I've I've uh, encountered that, and that's fine. And I'm definitely willing to consider Marxist ideas. I'm, I'm totally open to. Pretty much any leftist idea, anyone that wants a more egalitarian uh, world, a more uh, just and democratic world where power is shared more evenly and more justly and where the needs of the people are held up as the most important thing above profit, above uh, certain individual rights to... to run a business in whatever way you see fit. People that are on that side of things, that are working towards that, I would consider comrades. To Even if we disagree, even if I hate you as a person personally, there's plenty of people that claim to be leftists in one degree or another who I don't really like and I don't really follow. But that doesn't mean that, that I'm going to necessarily spend my time railing against them or that I'll never be open to anything they ever say. We'll just, we'll just give up one example. Uh, a lot of the time, I very much disagree with the, the podcaster and YouTuber, Peter Coffin. They come up with some, some ideas that I feel to be damaging to the left, damaging to the discourse, so on and so forth. I, I don't appreciate their style. I don't appreciate the way they go about things. That doesn't mean that, that I'm totally going to shut them out and never be open to any of their ideas. I still will listen to them from time to time, and I still will agree with them sometimes. I just mostly disagree, disagree with, with their approach. So that's just one example. I'm not an anarchist if I believe the employer can have you take part in medical experiments. Oh, boy. <laughs> if the workers are the employers... It's, it's, there's no separation there. So it's, it's the workers collectively deciding what's best for themselves. Workers shouldn't be able to decide what, what the safest working conditions are for them and what, what working conditions they'd like to pursue. You're saying one person should be able to in, in, endanger in the minds of everyone else workplace safety for their own personal freedoms to make decisions that, that, that can directly affect other people. It's you that doesn't believe in freedom. It, it, it's you that doesn't believe in, in any sort of, I mean, think about it this way. If the government said now, just, just uh, passed a law, interpreted another, a, a, an existing law, whatever. If for some one way or another it got onto the, the, the books, 
uh, and it got out into the public that it was okay for employers right now to decide whether or not uh, all their employees had to be vaccinated in order to keep working there. How would how would that be promoting more freedom if the structure was just a few people make that decision rather than everybody at the company? That would be worse, wouldn't it, in, in that case, because a, a board of directors, a single owner, they would be able to make the decision whether or not people had to be vaccinated to work. What I'm talking about is spreading out that decision among all the workers. That's, that's, that's the main change, okay? So even if, even if you don't like that particular policy, wouldn't it still be better if it was made by more people than less? By the people that are most affected rather than the people that can sit in their ivory tower and, and hand down decisions from on high? And anarchist authoritarian is a contradiction in terms. I, 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 I'm, I'm having trouble with where you get these ideas from. I'm double speaking hard right now. You're just throwing out terms, so I don't know. What do you what do you see as a better system? The one we have now, where employers by themselves can make all the decisions for their employees, or a system where decisions are made collectively and democratically. Which one's better for you? Which one promotes more freedom? Which one promotes more democracy? Which one is more authoritarian? I mean, come on, man. Which is more authoritarian? The Nuremberg trials? What are we getting to the Nuremberg trials? Okay. I'm not going to give you any more time for now. I'm going to give you a minute to, to think out an answer to the question that I have. I'm having a lot of trouble with people not being able to answer the questions that I ask again and again. Let's, let's, just, let's just focus on that one thing. Which is better? Which is, which is a better, more fair, more uh, just more democratic and free system one where a couple of people make all the decisions for a lot of people or one where everyone involved collectively makes that decision together democratically which one is which one is the system you'd rather live under current system or that system i need you to answer that before we can continue the agrarian middle ages gave us the baron and the serf the cities of the later Middle Ages show us the guildmaster and the journeyman and the day laborer. The 17th century has its manufacturing workers. The 19th century has big factory owners and proletarians. It is clear that up to now, the forces of production have never been developed to the point where enough could be developed for all, and that private property has become a fetter and a barrier in relation to the further development of the forces of production. Now, however, the development of big industry has ushered in a new period. Capital and the forces of production have been expanded to an unprecedented extent, and the means are at hand to multiply them without limit in the near future. Moreover, the forces of production have been concentrated in the hands of a few bourgeois, while the great mass of the people are more and more falling into the proletariat, their situation becoming more wretched and intolerable in proportion to the increase of wealth of the bourgeoisie. And finally, these mighty and easily extended forces of production have so far outgrown private property and the bourgeoisie that they threaten at any moment to unleash the most violent disturbances of the social order. Now, under these conditions, the abolition of private property has become not only possible, but absolutely necessary. 16. Okay, now here's a great place to stop. We're just about at the midway point. That'll be the end of the text for the night. So, have you answered my question, uh, Pierce Penniless? Democracy was a bad word, according to Aristotle himself. Do we live in Aristotle's system right now? Did Aristotle come up with, with capitalism? I just happened to read uh, uh, Plato's The Republic, which, which goes through, uh, supposedly, Socrates' ideal society. Do you know what the society he came up with was? A kingdom ruled by a king. Okay? Uh, where where the, the, it, was, it was basically a meritocracy to some extent, but the structure was, was completely hierarchical where you would have a king. That's the system that he wanted to live under. 
a system that still included slavery. Are you going to hold him up as the model for the government we should have today? I don't think I'd be making that argument. Let's see if he answered my question, though. I meant rule by the poor. Are the poor inherently bad? Do you, do you believe that the poor deserve their, their lot in life, that, that everything just shakes out naturally? You love that word natural. Do you think that everyone just, just ends up with, with the life that they deserve? Do they? Um, do, do, do rich people get rich because they deserve it? Do poor people get poor because they're dumb or they're, they're lazy or whatever? Love to know that one too. No one should want democracy as a lofty system of government. <laughs> Philosopher Kings. Okay, what does the term king mean? It means that the, the, the person who thinks the most, okay, he, the way he put it was basically the person that spends their time thinking the most about what is true and what is untrue should be the person set at the head of society that, that makes all the decisions as a king would. But this system, again, still involves slavery, legal slavery. Is this, again, the system that you want to be promoting? You still haven't answered my question, though. Yeah, and you know what? He, he didn't really say things all that much against democracy. It was kind of the middle road for him. What he put at the bottom was tyranny, was someone who, that, that through brute force, wrested power from everyone else and, and, and killed, slaughtered, betrayed their way to the top and ruled with an iron fist. That's what he thought was the lowest form of government, the most evil form of government. So you're wrong in that. Doesn't matter. Uh, you're, still, you're still not answering the question. Still not answering the question. What, so this is, this is your last chance, and then I'm, I'm, I'm not going to answer any more of your questions until you get through this one. Would you rather have a system that we have now where, by and large, a few people at the top of a company get to make all the decisions about all the major things that affect a, a, a worker's life in that company? Or would you rather have a system where those decisions are chosen democratically among all of the workers and everyone involved in the company? Which would you rather have? Pick, pick, just pick those two. Between those two options, which would you have? If you say Aristotle, I'm going to take that as a non-answer. And you know what? I read a lot of my day, too. I, I try to do about a book a week. I, let's, let's see where I'm at in my goal for the year. I think I'm a little behind. But I read a lot, too. So especially if it's an audiobook, I can get through it because I do landscaping. And a lot of that time, I'm just listening to my headphones. Um, let's see where I'm at in my, in my goal for this year. I've, oh yeah, I'm, I'm way behind at this point. I've only done 18 of, of my 52 books. So we're, we're well over half the year, but still I read 18 books this year. I, I've read a bunch of stuff. I like to read too. I don't know. I don't even know where we're going with that, but, but we'll just, we'll just get that pissing match out of the way right now. That's cool. If you read a lot, I love people that read a lot. I really need to know what your answer to that is. Pierce penniless. Otherwise I'm, I'm going to close it out for the, the night. Another way that you can, can reach me besides Twitch is by logging on to Facebook and looking for uh, Bread Theory there. That's what I am on Facebook. So you can follow me there. Uh, it's just at Bread Theory, all one word. And that's where I, I generally make my, my announcements about when I go live. Uh, if I have any change to my schedule, you'll see it there. You can also follow me on, on Twitch and a bunch of other places by going to linktr.ee slash bread theory. Look, look for me on, on Facebook. That's where you're going to have the best chance of getting to contact me if you have any questions, if you'd ever like to come on the show. I'm always looking for more guests. People from all different walks of life, all different opinions are always welcome. doesn't matter if you've read the book yourself. doesn't matter if you have a degree in theory or history or philosophy. I, I've always benefited from the, from the people that I talk to, no matter the level of expertise or, or background knowledge or wherever they're coming from. I always like having people to bounce ideas off that are, that are live. I recommend following Artsy Marxist. I uh, thank you for reminding me that. I will go ahead and uh, follow, give them a follow right now. And if they happen to be streaming, then I will go ahead and raid into them. Actually, you know what? I'm going to start the raid first. And as soon as we raid in, I'll give them a follow and you should too. So again, 
can find me in all my links, YouTube. I put all this out as an edited video on YouTube and as a podcast. I have a Facebook, a Twitter, an Instagram. You can buy my art, help support me. I'm getting real close, and, and you guys really helped me out tonight. I saw my numbers were up where they need to be tonight. I have an average of just over one viewer per stream. I'm still starting out. If I can just get to three, I've met every other metric, and I can get to be affiliate, and then I can start actually having... Uh, I can start monetizing this stream, the beginnings of that. And we can get custom emotes and it'll be a lot more fun to, to come and hang out here and all that stuff. So tell your friends if they're interested in theory, if they're interested in anything related to uh, leftist thought, uh, new urbanism or permaculture. I'm always talking about those sorts of things. Uh, if they just like to come have a fun time with, uh, you know, talking about weird political stuff, I, I'm your guy for that too. Oh, oh, I'm an artist. Yeah, I do uh, nature photography. I have it on a, a number of different um, mediums that you can buy it. Uh, I love nature photography. That's just one of my side hobbies. Uh, Peter Grotticelli, I will check that out as, as soon as I'm done rating here. Uh, so thank you for that suggestion, too. Thank you all for joining me tonight. If you can just hang on one moment, I will, I will go ahead and start the raid. Uh, Peter Grotticelli, I will... Oh, he's not on Twitch? I don't know... Uh, that name's not ringing a bell. Um, you got a couple more seconds here. Just an anarchist in the permaculture. Oh, very cool. I will check out that name. I will, I will find out wherever it is. You've been very helpful tonight. Cart Horse One, I hope you join me for future streams. Thanks to everyone who participated. Even if you frustrated me a little bit, that's okay. That's just part of the discourse. And hopefully we can get to a point where we understand each other better at the very least in future streams. Until next time, friends, Lectam. And I'll see you Sunday, hopefully.